Yay! Hello, Hello everyone. Anybody, Anybody want to say anything to Anthony? <laughs> What's, up? <laughs> What's up? There we go. Clinton, nah, Clinton won't even, he's not even going to do it. He's, he's tired. He's tired. Oh, oh, no, you've been disowned. You've been disowned. It's because Robert's beard is better than yours. Yeah. <laughs> So where do we leave off? We just barely started because we spent all that time in The Hobbit. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, let's go back to where we left off, which was um, chapter one. A second, I went too fast and I forgot it. Oh, yeah, we, we were on page uh, 32. Yeah, 32. We were on page 32. Okay. Yay! It's good stuff. Okay, we'll dig in here. So uh, th this is the part where uh, Bilbo has just disappeared. And when he goes to his house to get ready to leave, Gandalf is waiting for him. And we saw that Gandalf had put in a little fireworks to kind of, uh, uh, what do I uh, kind of cloak the fact that he used magic. You want to keep an invisibility ring safe, right, and quiet. So uh, anyway, they're they're getting ready. We we ended with that famous line uh, about two thirds of the way down page thirty-two. I feel like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. Clinton, is that what it felt like to have COVID? You said it was pretty bad. <laughs> pretty much, you said it was pretty bad. So, was it, it was pretty bad too? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Don't want to think about it. So, okay, then, beautiful line, very top of page 33. Uh, um, so actually, start on the bottom of 32 because this, this is a phrase that my family uses all the time because of the movie, maybe you do. Uh, he says, you know, I want, I want to see the mountains again, Gandalf mountains, right? I want to find rest, I want to leave. And he says, um, um, uh, I hope you will, but nobody will read the book. How he says, "Oh, they may." Frodo has read some already. As far as it has gone, you'll keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes, as often as I can spare them. Right? Do you say that? If I ask you, are you going to keep an eye on Wesley? Two eyes, as often as I can spare them. Okay. Nobody, your family doesn't use that line. We use that all the time. We should. We always should. Anyway, it's just, it's just great. Right then, okay. And then it is on the top of the page. Frodo is not ready. Okay, in the movie version, uh, between the leaving of Bilbo and the leaving of Frodo was like not even a year. Okay, but here it's 17 years. He's 33, Frodo's 33 in the beginning, and he's 50 when he leaves. We said that's the same age Bilbo was when he was. So he is really older, uh, and, and it makes for a little bit of difference now and then. Uh, some, some of the things that this Frodo says rather than the Frodo in the movie seem to fit a little more with someone that's older. And also, like I said, he's about 15 years older than Sam. Sam's about 35, and he's about 50, and Mary and Pippin are around that age, too. They're a lot younger. And as I said, Faramir is actually exactly the same age as Sam, which is kind of interesting. Um, and oh, by the way, this will come up a lot, but so don't forget, most people probably take for granted that the character that Tolkien most identified with was Gandalf, but he said it's actually Faramir. It will be a while before we get to him. But he said Faramir was the character he most liked. He's a great character. He is. Are there any... Has Wesley got some Faramir in him? What do you think? <laughs> we'll see. This is her fiancé. He better have some Faramir. <laughs> anyway. So, but Frodo's not ready to leave yet. Bilbo would be happy to have him come, but he's not ready. And this is the reason. Top of 33. He would come with me, of course, if I asked him. In fact, he offered to once, just before the party. But he does not really want to yet. I want to see the wild country again before I die in the mountains. But he is still in love with the Shire, with woods and fields and little rivers. He's not ready to go yet. Bilbo's ready to go. He's, he's 111. He's, we'll see if uh, the great Stuart Morris makes He's 101 this year. We'll see if he makes it 111. That'd be pretty tough. But he is 101. Still going strong. By the way, Stuart Morris uh, got COVID over the summer when he was still 100. And he survived. I don't even think he had many symptoms. <laughs> Apparently he had COVID. I mean, that's pretty amazing. He's 100 years old. <laughs> the COVID didn't know what to do to him, you know? It's like, what's going on, man? <laughs> Did you all read that wonderful fake bit of news? <laughs> As if there's anything else these days. But that wonderful fake bit of news uh, that said Chuck Norris got COVID. Uh, and it was a great struggle. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, COVID got away with his life. For something when they put it was so it looked so realistic when he got there. And you could just you know it's great. I didn't know if it's true, but it was great. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, check Norris. He's a deadly guy. Anyway, 
the, uh, so he, he's not ready to go, okay? And then we have the long, important dialogue about the ring, right? I'm going to leave the ring for him. Oh, it's in my pocket. And in, one thing that the movie does that's nice is in the book, they, they, they put the ring pretty quickly in the envelope and you don't see it. But in the movie, it's nice because when Frodo, uh, Bilbo gives it up, it, like, he drops it and you can see it like clinging to his flesh and it's got this heavy thudding sound that's really powerful, okay? Uh, so that, that was kind of neat the way they did it. But this dialogue is very similar. I mean, it has to be because this is, this is the very beginning. Um, and he's like, you should leave it behind, right? Um, and then, then he says about, about the middle of page 33, well, yes and no, now it comes to it. I, I don't like parting with it at all. I might say, and I don't really see why I should. Why do you want me to? Look at it says, a curious change came over his voice. It was sharp with suspicion and annoyance. Right? How many of you thought the scariest part of the movie, if you've seen it, is when they're in Rivendell and he reaches out to touch the ring? Ah! And then the face comes out. Woo! Oh, this scream! Oh, it's great, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't tell anybody the first time, but I mean, ah! and he suddenly looks shriveled up, sort of like the Black Riders look, all shriveled up. So suddenly, you know, this is not the normal Bilbo. It's really tough. He was sharp with suspicion and annoyance. You're always badgering me about my ring, but you have never bothered me about the other things I got on my journey. No, but I had to badger you. I wanted the truth. It was important. Magic rings are, well, magical, and they are rare, and curious. He tells him, I think you've had it long enough. Remember, he's had it for 61 years, okay? Because he was 50. So he's had it for 61 years. Anybody remember why he probably took not too much harm from the ring? Because he didn't kill Gollum, like we saw last time, right? If he, he began his possession of the ring with an act of mercy and pity that we mentioned when we were talking about the Hobbit last week. And it'll be mentioned again here. But it's important that he began it that way. Okay? Uh, how, how did Gollum, he used to be called Smeagol, how did he begin his possession of the ring? Yeah, by murder, by killing Deagle. And for those of you that this was the first time, you might be shocked to find out that Deagle in the book is just his friend, right? In the movie, he's what? Uh, not even cousin, but his brother, which I, I think is actually a, a kind of a good change in the movie. You know, because because what does it call up, of course? Yeah, Cain and Abel. I mean, that this 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 sort of taboo guilt. I mean, it's obvious it's always bad to kill somebody, okay? But if you kill, you know, a family member, or if you kill, you know, an English professor, if you kill an artist. Uh, it's, it's a special taboo. Right? <laughs> Especially if they're wearing a sacred geometry uh, crown, you know, you've got to be careful. So. Um, well, I don't know. Not, not before her wedding. We'll wait, we'll wait till Okay. <laughs> like, like, the, like Frankenstein, you get strangled afterwards. Eh? <laughs> Just, uh, I don't know, get a scare. That's right. <laughs> Ellie was just in my class. We read Frankenstein. Good yeah. stuff. <laughs> I will be with you on your wedding night. <laughs> Scary stuff. So anyway, he says, Bilbo flushed and there was an angry light in his eyes. His kindly face grew hard. We need to understand, you know, what this ring does to us, right? Don't be possessed by that which you possess. It is a good way to put it. Be careful. Don't, Don't be possessed by that which you possess. Look for this as you're reading. When you get to the part where the fellowship is leaving Lothlorien, that's the wood, Galadriel gives all of them what? You know? Yeah, different kinds of gifts, right? Different kinds of things, right? And she gives a blessing to Gimli, the dwarf, which is a wonderful blessing. I wonder if any of you know it. She basically says... May your hands flow with gold, but may gold have no dominion over you. Isn't that beautiful? Can we not be possessed by that which we possess? Once it takes possession of us, I guess it kind of becomes an idol or something. May you be able to hold it lightly. 
right? It's pretty amazing stuff. It's very difficult, right? Very difficult. Um, and, uh, well, um, so the, the anger light in his eyes, okay? And he says, Bilbo flushed, he gets really angry, and he says, my, I found it. It came to me. Yes, yes, but there is no need to get angry. Okay. It's like talking politics with someone today. If I am, it is your fault. It is mine, I tell you, my own, my precious. Yes, my precious. It has been called that before, not by you. When we did the, when we did the marathon, uh, I, I don't know if this uh, attracted the young man to my daughter or scared him away, but my daughter like almost said every single line throughout the whole 12-hour movie, which, you know, is kind of geeky for a guy, but maybe it's a little scary for a girl, I don't know, but I'm scared away. Can you do it? Can you say almost all the lines as they say them? Princess Bride, maybe? Possibly. Or, uh, could, you could you do that with any movies, Clinton? Uh, oh, oh right. okay, just, just everyone. Oh, you can do it. Pretty much all of it. Pretty much all of it. Oh, my gosh, this is wild. Marzi, can you do that with a good Archer, Archer Hepburn movie? No. Maybe a few lines. But some people just do this. Hey, I, I used to have a Bible study at my house, and one time, I don't, I don't think this was your group, the, these couple guys... They started going through the entire dialogue of, uh, I don't know what's it called. Uh, <laughs> what's the Disney cartoon with the with the with the with the Incas and stuff? What's it called? Uh, Emperor, Emperor's New Groove. <laughs> of all things to memorize, the Emperor's New Groove. But they're going on with every single line. It was hysterical. You like that too? I mean, it's a good movie. But they're like with the whole thing. This is insane. Of all things to memorize, they probably don't have anything. Other you know? oh, oh, here like it too. Oh, it is great. I love that. It's basically Chuck Jones animation. It's great. Anyway. Oh, my gosh. The, uh, okay, so he says, it has been called that before. Well, I know. Even if Gollum said the same, it's not his now, but mine. And I shall keep it, I say. You will be a fool if you do, Bilbo. You make that clear with every word you say. It has got far too much hold on you. Let it and then you can go yourself and be free. There's an ongoing theme in this book for almost all the evil characters that the thing that hurts them, they love it and they hate it at the same time. So Gollum loves the ring and hates the ring. Later on we find out he, he wants the sun, but he hates the sun at the same time. Even when we meet the Barrow Whites, those scary, that's not in the movie, those scary uh, ghosts that go after them, they're like yearning for the warmth and they hate the warmth at the same time. I mean, he just, is, is this addictive behavior? <laughs> okay? I mean, you, 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 you yearn for the very thing that hurts you. In fact, Dante, some of you that were in my Dante class, uh, when the sinners are going to hell, it says, they yearn for what they fear. They're reaching out and trying to hold on to the very thing that is destroying them. So we're getting some pretty deep psychological insight. You know, some people make fun of uh, Lord of the Rings. Oh, it, it doesn't have you know, deep psychology like a Freudian novel or something. But actually, its exploration of evil and what it does to us is actually very, very accurate uh, throughout the beginning. So he speaks sternly. I'll, I'll do as I choose and, and go as I please. Now, now, my dear hobbit. All your long life we have been friends, and you owe me something. Come, do as you promised. Give it up. That was his plan. I'm going to leave it to Frodo. But when it comes to it, he doesn't want to let go of it. It holds on to him. Even though it's hurting him, he can't give it up. Wow. And then he says, all right, I won't give my precious away. Gandalf's eyes flashed. It will be my turn to get angry soon. If you say that again, I shall... Then, then you, you will see Gandalf, Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. He took a step towards the hobbit and he seemed to grow tall and menacing. His shadow filled the little room. Remember what I told you Gandalf is? What are the wizards? Yeah, they're those Maya. They're ultimately angelic beings, lower order angelic beings, as is Sauron. Right? So he is, they, they are cloaked in the sort of flesh of, you know, like a wise old man with a long beard kind of wizard, right? Which is every wizard in Dungeons and Dragons, right? Because there is no Dungeons and Dragons without Lord of the Rings, right? It all comes out of that, right? Um, 
So what do, what do you think? Did, 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 did your parents let you do D&D or did they consider that like of the devil? Of the devil? Say, they, 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 it's, it's funny. Dungeons and Dragons, have you ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons? It's a role-playing game, RPG. And all, all of those role-playing games actually came out of Tolkien. Not, not that Tolkien invented it. He was, thought they were all crazy, but uh, it all came out of that. And, you know, the Dungeon Master. We're, we're, Clayton, were you ever a DM, a Dungeon Master? Yeah. My best friend in high school was Warhammer. Yeah? And so his parents the Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, yeah. Some, I don't know. Some of them. So we just always played Marvel Universe. Oh, <laughs> it's funny one, one of my best students from like 20 years ago one of my great homeschool girl students and stuff I remember that the guys wanted to play D&D &D and she was all up and arms this is terrible said, what's terrible well it's, it, it's role playing your take and I said Jennifer I, yeah, Je she was an actress and she was a really good actress you know what's the difference <laughs> anyway but it was just I don't know that's just been an ongoing thing I mean obviously you, you know you don't want to be saying spells and opening yourself up to spiritual things I mean that can be a day but that's not usually what they're playing Okay, there. And and uh, how many how, how many sided dice did you have? Did you have a thirty two sided dice? Sixteens, yeah. That cool. Sixteen sided dice. You know, this could be the theme of your artwork for next week. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, if you have something, I don't know, a, 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 a kind of a reflection on art, because like I said, they, they, the whole concept comes out of Lord of the Rings, and then it spread out in all different directions. And all. Uh, but that was the inspiration. People took it seriously. It's like a religion. Uh, back, like in the 70s, you would actually see people scrawling graffiti on the wall, Frodo for president. I mean, that was like a big thing that you would see written on the wall. It's kind of cool. Anyway, so, but this concept of... I mean, I don't know, did you ever think about it? Now you're reading it, most of you have seen the movie, how little magic Gandalf actually does in this? Not too much. You know, I mean, he, he's got, you know, sometimes it's just his staff, lighting up his staff. He does fight the Balrog, of course. Uh, but he does, even, even in The Hobbit, I mean, there's one point where he's got the pine cones lit on fire and they're throwing them down at the wolves, the wargs. But generally speaking, he doesn't do a whole lot of magic. He keeps himself cloaked. And only here and a few other places does he just give a glimpse of his greater power. Now, does anybody know what other character? This may not be as clear in the movie, but it's very clear in the book. What other character often does not show his full power? What's it? Oh, no, I need to take him to Tom. That, that's true. That's Tom. He's kind of a cool character. And like I said, not only does he not appear in the movie, he doesn't even appear in the radio play version. It's like, I don't know what to do with Tom Bombadil, right? But, but that's true. Yeah, he, we, we see his power. But there's another main character of the Fellowship that a lot of times we don't quite see his power. It's Aragorn, okay? And, we'll, and that's something we miss because we don't always necessarily see that in the movie. It's kind of hard to show it. Uh, but there are several times where... You know, you know, this, you know, ranger, ranger who really is the heir of Isildur. He is the, the rightful king uh, when he comes into his inheritance. Uh, and by the way, another thing that's clear in the book but not clear in the movie is Elrond will not give his daughter to Aragorn until he is the king of everything. It's gonna be, that doesn't quite come out in the, in the movie. It's, it's only about the immortality thing. But in the book, there's a few places where, you know, okay, once you're the... The, the great king, king of the north and the south, then you'll be, you know, more worthy of my daughter. <laughs> that sort of stuff, you know. So. Anyway, it's interesting. Um, so, so again, this this idea of cloaking your power and not showing the fullness of it, right? Even though Jesus does a lot of miracles, he clearly cloaks his power in the Gospels, right? What does he tell, uh, you know, Pilate? If I wanted, what what could I do? What would God send me? Yeah. yeah, legions, legions of angels will come and save me, right? Uh, but but he doesn't. He doesn't use that power. Oh, good. Yeah. That's right. It's, it's not the norm. It's true. And e even in the Bible, notice that the, lots of miracles group around certain times and places. You know, where, 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 where do we get the biggest grouping of miracles, you know? One, One of them is the Gospels, <laughs> obviously. Or else? Good Acts. Good Acts. So the, the, you know, the early church in Acts, you get a lot of them. What about in the Old Testament? 
the, the whole exodus you know, has lots of things around it and then the, the next time would be the sort of beginning of the prophets Elijah uh, and, and uh, Elisha and there, there just seem to be certain places where miracles accumulate at important times yeah and what one person I didn't come up with this idea but somebody made a very interesting concept that in some ways those miracles always seem to cluster around the Bible itself right so you've got the Pentateuch Right? You've got the prophetic books, you've got the Gospels, you've got Acts, and arguing that they seem to center around the Word. Okay? Oh, that's true. That will be the next outpouring, maybe. Oh, good, that's true. Good. And if we're from Kentucky, we've got to add one more thing. Did I not pick up snakes in your name? <laughs> snake <church. laughs> the Snake head. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, that, that's true. As we, we move towards it. But it's just important that Gandalf does not overshow his power. He tries to rule by wisdom. Now, Saruman starts using more and more of his power, but it's a more evil power. We talked already about this instrumental magic, and that will come back later. Uh, but anyway, so we've got this fight, and then he, he shows his power, and then, you know, and the movie does that well. It's, it's like a dark uh, shadow as he gets taller looking, and Bilbo's, you know, all, ner uh, Bilbo's all nervous and stuff like that, uh, and he comes down, and uh, Gollum says, well, well, I, I, I'm not a thief, whatever he said. And continue on. I have never called you one, and I am not one either. I am not trying to rob you, but to help you. I mean, could this not be a, a friend talking to someone who's addicted to drugs or something? Right? I'm not here to steal your, you know, your cocaine, whatever. I'm here to help you. Okay? I mean, like I said, this is a real insight into addictive behavior. Uh, I wish you would trust me as you used to. He turned away, and the shadow passed. And we're talking about the, the shadow of, of Gandalf's strength. And it says... He seemed to dwindle again to an old gray man, bent and troubled. That's not me, I hope. <laughs> to an old gray man, bent and troubled. <laughs> yeah, they, they did. I mean, you, you see it, then suddenly he comes back. Right? Slow down. Now, now, that, that word, word dwindle, is echoed later on. I wonder if you know when another character says, I shall dwindle and go into the West and remain Galadriel. We'll see that. All shall love me and despair. There's not a dark side in you, Marcy, is there? All will love me and despair. <laughs> so, anyway, it's, a, it's great. The movie does it so well. Okay, so, Galadriel. Anyway, um, so down he goes. Old gray man bent and troubled. Bilbo, you know, drew his hand over his eye. You know, it's, it's almost like you're waking up. What, what was I doing? What was I doing? I'm, I'm sorry, but but I felt so queer, and yet it would be a relief in a way not to be bothered with it anymore. It has been so growing on my mind lately. Sometimes I have felt it was like an eye looking at me. We'll learn a little bit more about that because it's tied to the eye of Sauron. Right? And I'm always wanting to put it on and disappear. Don't you know? <laughs> a little bit of a British mission, don't you know? <laughs> British say that. Uh, or one, not, not you know, like we say in, in English, but the British is, don't you know? Um, or wondering if it is safe and pulling it out to make sure. I tried locking it up, but I found I couldn't rest without it in my pocket. I don't know why, and I don't seem able to make up my mind. Wow. Isn't it interesting that the ring makes you invisible? Who was the first person to try to be invisible before God? Yeah, and they, remember? What, what, what did it say? Uh, and, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid because, because, they, were, because they were naked and ashamed. Right? And God says, where are you? And, you know, most critics will say, well, obviously God knows where he is. He's like, where are you spiritually? Where, where? But it's interesting that the first thing they try to do is hide them. They, they not only, you know, will try to hide, you know, their nakedness, but they're trying to hide themselves from God. This becoming of, of invisibility, right? Um, 
the uh, and there's the phrase I've kind of said before then trust mine it is quite made up go away and leave it behind stop possessing it because the more you possess it the more it possesses you uh, his friend C.S. Lewis wrote a, a series of science fiction novels called the Space Trilogy and in the second one our hero goes to Venus this beautiful place full of water and waves and there's this tree and when he there's like a bubble tree when he pops it it like gives him a shower that invigorates him it's this amazing experience and he's about to do it again and something stops him no and and this is a helpful phrase this is not a Tolkien phrase but it's a helpful Lewis phrase he calls it the danger of the encore what do you think he means by that you know that word encore we use it if we want the opera singer to sing another you know round encore but what do you think the danger of the encore is what are we tempted to do? Good. Good. I'm going to have it again and again and again. Right? I'm going to have it again and again and again. Right? I'm sure you've all experienced that with like snacking at night. Something like that. Right? I, I don't know if this is true, but is, isn't it, don't, don't they say that about, I think they say that particularly about the high fructose corn syrup, that it is kind of in a way addictive. Like you have, it, you have to have more and more. More than just regular sugar, that, whatever that is. Like maybe it's because your body absorbs it really fast or something. Uh, but I'm told, have you heard that? Honestly, I've heard some of those things. I've just seen a bit, but it's the encore is I want to possess it and have it again and again and again. Possess it and have it at my fingertips. So we should have as if we don't have. Is is there anything that we can let go? Wow. Um, again, all of this is there's an emotional resonance, a spiritual resonance, a psychological resonance to all these things. Uh, give it to Frodo, and I will look after him. Bilbo stood for a moment, tense and undecided. Presently, he sighed, All right, I will. Then he shrugged his shoulders and smiled rather ruefully. After all, that's what this party business was all about, really. To give away lots of birthday presents and somehow make it easier to give it away at the same time. It hasn't made it any easier in the end, but it would be a pity to waste all my preparations. It would quite spoil the joke. Indeed, it would take away the only point I ever saw in the affair. Very well, so Bibbo, it goes to Frodo with all the rest. He drew a deep breath, and now I gotta get off. And what does Bibbo say? Still in your pocket. Perfect. Like I said, this this whole page is like word for word of the movie. Um, uh, uh, come on, give it up. And uh, no, don't give the ring to me. Put it on the mantelpiece. It will be safe enough there till Frodo comes. I shall wait for him. I love in the movie where he takes it and he puts it down. And I always would have loved a different version where he put it and then he licked the, <laughs> licked the envelope. And of course, he does it the right way with the, what, the seal, the wax seal. And if you ever try a wax seal, have you ever sent out letters with a wax seal? You've done that, Paul? It's pretty cool. I remember buying the kids one of those when we were at the Rent Fest and Stacy used it for one of her birthday you know, invitations. You've done that too? It's, like a, it's really cool. He put the wax and it was a seal with a dragon on it, I think, and put it all there. So cool stuff. Man. Seal. Let me be as a seal around you. Uh, don't give it Put it on the mantelpiece. So he, Bilbo took out the envelope, but just as he was about to set it by the clock, his hand jerked back, and the packet fell on the floor. In the movie, we actually see the ring. Before he could pick it up, the wizard stooped and seized it and set it in its place. A spasm of anger passed swiftly over the hobbit's face again. Suddenly, it gave way to a look of relief and a laugh. Well, that's that. Now I'm off. There's still a childlike aspect to him. Right? As soon as that weight is gone, there's like this immediate liberation. It's immediate. It's suddenly, boom, clean. Right? Man, good stuff. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, like, like you said, he, he's, again, doesn't want us to think that it's a simple one-to-one -one correspondence like Pilgrim's Progress. And, but it applies. And, and, and that is why he, he does say, not allegory, but applicability, right? It's something you can apply. And he's just playing around. I mean, there, there are things. I mean, it, it is, it's not as clear as it is in, in say, uh, Lord of the Rings. But he is understanding a spiritual dimension that is uh, powerful. But it's still consistent within this world. But right? it's not like it's in a way artificially superimposed. It makes sense within the 
you know, paradigm, the worldview, the microcosm that he's the, the sub creation. That's the word Tolkien uses. The sub creator it is his little world that he creates. It, it makes sense, and it's there. That's a good way to put it. Good. It's not And, and, you know, th those are the best, you know, like, I, I really prefer movies, you know, when they, they have a fantasy movie, and instead of explaining all the magic, we just have to accept it, okay? You, you, if the movie's well made, we'll see a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and then we'll just accept it, right? If it's bad, um, like most of the Batman movies, um, then, then, you know, I just, I just don't buy it. <laughs> but uh, there are some good ones, there are some good ones, but most of them are, you know, ultimately, like, I just don't buy any of this, you know? It's ridiculous. Have, like, like that, like that ridiculous. I mean, okay, you know, the, the bat, the, the second one, you know, was cool in terms of its questions, but the third one was ridiculous. He's like in some pit in the middle of what, like the Middle East, and then all of a sudden he's in Manhattan. Just, it was just so absolutely insane. What well, was Dark Knight Rises? That was the third one. That was insane, and I couldn't understand anything the villain said. Also, and probably didn't care to. But the. Uh, <laughs> I just, I, it's, no, sir. Go on and watch. What do they call that? Uh, honest trailers, and let it list every single ludicrous aspect of that third movie. It just goes on and on. It was just so hysterical. But it did have Marion Cotillard. Do you know her? She's a beautiful friend. Might be one of the best living actresses. Actually, she's French. She was in the movie. That, that, that kind of saved it. Marion Cotillard. Anyway, the uh, so so then we've got that beautiful poem on on on, uh, on the next page. We already said again, the road goes ever on and on. And as we said before, this the road is a character. And as far as I can tell, it's always under it's always capitalized. Road, the road goes ever on and on. We continue, we move, but we're always going away, right? Uh, we're always moving. You know, the uh, the uh, oh, have you been to Rome? I thought so. Have you been to the Quo Vadis Church? It's outside Rome, along the Via, Via Appia. Okay, yeah, they must have showed it to you. Do you, do you know what the story, the Quo Vadis story is? Do you know the story? Okay, uh, Quo Vadis is Latin for with, where are you going? Whither goest thou? It's a, the whole phrase is Quo Vadis Dominus. Whither goest thou, O Lord? And the story is, it's, it's an old tradition, it's not in the Bible, but it's an old tradition that as the persecution under Nero was beginning, Peter was warned and he was going to escape. And as he was walking down the Via Appia, leaving, he saw Christ walking towards Rome. And he said to him, in Latin, which probably wouldn't have spoken Latin, but anyway, Quo vadis domine, whither goest thou, O Lord? And does anybody know what Jesus said? I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. And then Peter turned around and returned and was martyred. And the story is he was holding a staff and he put the staff down and he turned and he went back and then the staff butted, is the old legend. And what's really funny, I love antiquities. If you go to the Quo Vadis Church, uh, just outside, there's a little um, piece of concrete that they say is Jesus' footprints. I'm sorry, that's kind of funny. Uh, but the story, it's a very old story. Um, but whither go is that? Where do you go? Which way do I go, Lord? They're, they're always, the road is, is, is a living creature. And I just, like I said, that, I said it before, it's a dangerous business going out your door, right? That, that's something to think about. We can be swept off, and so the road almost becomes like a river, and it's compared to a mighty river. And, you know, every path starts at a doorway. Every doorway is feeding into this great river that's a road. And where will it take you off to? It might bring you to Houston of all places, Marcy. Probably never thought that, right? Wow. So, it's, it's cool. And you've come, you've come a ways as well. Oh, that's, no, you're right, because it's archetypal. It, it, it is, oh yeah. It's, it's great. The, the book I did called On the Shoulders of Hobbits, The Road to Virtue with Tolkien and Lewis, there's a section on virtue and vice, but there's a whole section just on the road. Because that's what it's about. It's about being a pilgrim. We've said before, so many great stories are about being pilgrims on the road, right? As you're moving along. Go ahead. That one's... Actually, I can tell you when it was published. It was published the same year that the Hobbit movie came out. I know that because it was going to come out, whatever, 2013, and then they delayed the movie by a year, and the publisher said... 
We're delaying your book. Oh, okay. I mean, it makes sense. You generally do better. So, so whenever that was, 2014, 15 or something. It's just been it's been five years, maybe. No, no, he's he's also called the great. There's, in fact, I think Mithrandir. I think that actually translates as great program. If I remember, I may be a little off on that because he's got so many different names. Uh, always, always the different names of Gandalf. But yeah, he, he is the great pilgrim too. Uh, and then, uh, and you, you all know the the the, the, the funny, uh, uh, whatever I know, it's an honest trailer. One of those funny ones. Somebody said, "Man, the Lord of the Rings movie is really white. Everybody in that movie is white. Even when they die, they come back whiter." So I mean, that's just the funniest line, you know. And uh, which one? Oh, oh clerks! I saw. It. I, I almost made it to the first one. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> oh really? Oh my gosh! Oh okay. Oh, they shot. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. And actually, there's a there's a Veggie Tale. The Lord of the Beans. Yeah, I think I've got that. You know. Yeah, it's a Veggie Tale. Lord of the Beans. That's great. I love it. <laughs> and then uh, I won't show you, but we find out that Bilbo told different stories about the ring at first you know you know he didn't steal and he did and and actually i don't have a copy but if you get a copy of the original hobbit the hobbit that everybody reads today uh tolkien changed it slightly uh and changed that scene a little bit to link up a little bit closer to the lord of the rings and i don't have a copy of it but i believe that in some ways the original version sounds a little bit more like bilbo's original version so this is what we call this sort of intertextuality or it's very postmodern is it it's commenting upon itself I think it's kind of cool um but you know he tries to make an excuse that well it was given to me or something just just like Smeagol always calls it his birthday present well it wasn't his in, in this case his friend you know got it and he said give it to me because it's my birthday no I won't give it to you I've already I already gave you a present right uh, I mean whew, he throttles him quick too in the, in the, in the book it happens like whew, really scary and I think that was just Peter Jackson being nice and allowing, uh, 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 what's his name, um, Andy Serkis to actually do something without makeup, you know, for a while. He still was in makeup, you know. But anyway, that guy's Greek, by the way, Andy Serkis, the Greek name. He's from Australia, but he's, he's Greek. Interesting. Um, I don't know if that, that's good for, or not for, for Greeks, but anyway. The, um, okay, uh, jump ahead to, to chapter two, page 42. The Shadow of the Past. This is when it all started coming together when he wrote this book, or this chapter and conceived of the whole thing. You ever look at yourself in the mirror in the morning and you've forgotten what you look like because of these stupid masks? Oh, I scared myself. I forgot what I look like. Anyway, the... Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so look what happens. Uh, the talk did not die down in nine or even 99 days. Okay, but like I said, it's a long period. The second disappearance of Mr. Bilbo Baggins was discussed in Hobbiton and indeed all over the Shire for a year and a day and was remembered much longer than that. It became a fireside story for young hobbits and eventually Mad Baggins, who used to vanish with a bang and a flash and reappear with bags of jewels and gold, became a favorite character of legend and lived on long after all the true events were forgotten. Isn't that wonderful? Bilbo already becomes a legend. It's like we're already thrown in. And like I said, that that's what's amazing about this book, that there's layers and layers of history and legend. You can keep digging and digging and down and down. And even the Hobbit has some of that, but not as much as this does. Um, so they go on, and then look, look uh, skip down a few paragraphs. It says, some people were rather shocked, but Frodo kept up the custom of giving Bilbo's birthday party year after year until they got used to it. He said that he did not think Bilbo was dead. When they asked, where is he then? He shrugged his shoulders. So this becomes a ritual, almost like what? This constant celebrating of his birthday when he's gone. You see how it almost becomes a religious festival? Almost like Easter or Christmas or something like that, or, or a mass if you want to think of it weekly. I mean, it, it's, very, it, it's very sacramental. It's just kind of a fascinating way of doing it. Um, uh, and so it, it, it becomes a ritual that is, is performed again and again. And there's almost a messianic element. Will Bilbo come back again? Or is he gone forever? So it, it, those, are the, those are the more subtle ways he layers in uh, this, these ideas, which is just kind of cool, right? Uh, I mean, so maybe Bilbo's leaving was like the ascension of Christ, right? 
Anyway, the uh, look at uh, okay. Look at the next page. Uh, forty three. Yeah, forty three. Um, uh, about two thirds of the way down the page, another beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay, it says. Um, so it was until his forties were running out and his fiftieth birthday was drawing near. Seventeen years go by. The incompetent, <laughs> the incompetent wizard has done nothing for seventeen years. I mean, we see it. You know, he's been trying, but he's awful slow. Awful slow. Um, like these poor people in, in grad school that take like 12 years to write their dissertation. Just give it up, man, and get a job. Just give it up. <laughs> that, 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 that's the thing. You've got to be, I mean, you know, the, the coursework is fine, but when it gets to that dissertation, which is a book, you've got to be really self-focused or you're just there forever. You knock it out. Anyway, so it says, uh, 50 was a number that he felt was somehow significant or ominous. It was at any rate at that age that venture had suddenly befallen Frodo. And then it says, Frodo began to feel restless, and the old paths seemed too well trodden. He looked at maps and wondered what lay beyond their edges. Maps made in the Shire showed mostly white spaces beyond its borders. You ever felt like that? You feeling restless? You feeling restless? <laughs> Ellie, I think you're restless. Oh, you still you still live at home? Yeah, that's why you're really restless. <laughs> Let me go. Let me. But I mean, just it's wonderful. The old paths seem too well. What what did Bilbo say in, in, in chapter one? He's still half in love with the Shire. He needs to be ready to go. I know. Have any of you ever looked at a map and wondered what was in the edges? You like looking at old maps? Anybody? What what did it often say? Often in the edges of old ancient maps. You know that phrase here. Here there'd be monsters, or here there'd be tigers, or dragons, or something. Here there'd be dragons, or here there'd be dragons. Just the scary things off in the end. Yeah. And all, and, and 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 as you're about to find out, uh, <laughs> you're about to find out, Abigail, that off the edge of the map is Nagadocious. <laughs> Not too exciting, but anyway, you in there. Okay, it's really there. No monsters. No monsters. So she's going to be getting married in Nagadocious. This is too cool, man. Nagadocious. Can, Can you spell Nagadoshes for us? <laughs> Can't do it, see? It's wild. My son teaches in Bernie, Texas. Anybody want to try to spell Bernie? Yeah, you got it. There it is. Bernie, Texas. It's really funny. And they got something that looks like, uh, what is it? Behar, but they pronounce it Bexar. What, what is it? Or bear? No, bear. It looks like Behar or Bexar. They pronounce it bear. That, that's it. Yeah. Did you live, did you live in that area once, Paula? Oh, you did. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful out there. Anyway, so again, there is that that yearning, that desire. It, it's the idea of joy and desire that propels him. He's ready to go. To, um, you know, uh, what, what, what does Bilbo say at the very end of the book? He's about to leave. Such a beautiful line. Gandalf, I think I'm ready for another adventure. It's wonderful. And now he's like the little old hobbit. I'm ready for another adventure. Are you ready for another adventure, Amanda? <laughs> A little banditry, if nothing else. A little Bonnie and Clyde banditry. Tell <laughs> 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 the Louise, yeah. That was a funny one. Anyway, uh, there, and just look, there's this, this whole idea of coming and going. There were rumors of strange things happening in the world outside. And as Gandalf had not at that time appeared or sent any message for several years, Frodo gathered all the news he could. Elves, who seldom walked in the Shire, could now be seen passing westward through the woods in the evening, passing and not returning. But they were leaving Middle-earth and were no longer concerned with its troubles. There's a, there's a, they're leaving. The Grey Haven is the place where you get the boat and it takes you back to Valinor. If you're allowed, you can go back to Ferry uh, in, in, in the far west. And uh, yeah, I've got to tell you something funny it's just about language. Uh, a friend and I have been trying to get our movie made for like 10 years. We have a, a whole movie we've made of C.S. Lewis's conversion, the broadcast talks, all this sort of stuff. And I remember we were, one time we were working with some guy from from uh, 
from uh, Australia. And, you know, in, in it, in it, there's a scene where he's reading a book called Fantasties and he sees a fairy. And the guy, like, wanted to change that word. Because fairy, no, you can't put fairy in there. Right? But, but then, uh, you know, if he wrote the script, he'd be using the word queer everywhere. So it's just kind of funny how languages you know, are different. You know? So we say strange. Like, like, if you listen to the Focus on the Family uh, Narnia movie books, every time it says queer, they just change it to strange. Okay, because so it looks out queer, you know. But the same thing with fairy. Like, you went crazy. You can't say fairy! So, anyway, it's just kind of funny. The, um, so, so they're, they're moving, moving on. on. If any of you are into Christian musicians, there's a really cool husband and wife team called the Grey Havens. If you've ever heard of them, they do Christian music. My son's got some of their some of their music. They're pretty good. I actually, we heard them once live. They're pretty good. Anyway, okay, let, let, let's jump ahead now to um, page 47. Now we're going to learn more about the ring. We'll learn more about the ring. So much to do. Okay. Uh, he is explaining uh, near the top of page 47. I guess it be the first full paragraph. A mortal Frodo who keeps one of the great rings does not die, but he does not grow or obtain more life. He merely continues until at last every minute is a weariness. And if he often uses the ring to make himself invisible, he fades. He becomes, in the end, invisible permanently and walks in the twilight under the eye of the dark power that rules the rings. Yes, sooner or later, later if he is strong or well-meaning to begin with, like Bilbo, but neither strength nor good purpose will last. Sooner or later, the dark power will devour him. Here you go. Hold on to it, Frodo, the poor guy. Okay, so, look at there. Maybe the best way to put this is the ring gives you longevity. That's why, you know, Bilbo's 111 still looks very well preserved. But it is what you might call a counterfeit immortality. What ultimately makes uh, Darth Vader go to the dark side? Anakin go to the dark side in, in, in episode three. Wasn't it? I mean, basically, he, wanted, he thought he could save uh, Padme. Padme? Padme? Padme. 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 I didn't get it right. Padme. Okay. That was whacked out. Make makeup she had. Anyway, Padme. The, I want to say Padmini for some reason. I don't know. That, maybe I knew somebody named Padmini. I don't know. What's that? Panini. 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 <laughs> That's right. Panini. That's right. That's good stuff. The, um, <laughs> but notice how the ring makes you invisible to yourself, to God, cuts you off from community. It stretches out your life. But, but it's a, a horrible life. life. Okay, so, so can, can anybody, anybody, you know, we, we use the word for archetype. Uh, are there other images? images? I mean, in, in this, this book, book that, that describes Gollum. Gollum. It, it describes Sauron. Sauron. It, it describes, describes the Black Riders. Riders. In, the, in a way, it describes Saruman as well. Can, can you think of other characters, you know, like in literature or whatever, that would fit this description? He does not grow or obtain more life. He merely continues until every minute is a weariness. Oh I, oh, I need to think of it. That's a good one. You're right, you're right because he, he's and he's not, not an old, an old man, man, but you're right. He's, he, yeah, he's, he's, he's given up all hope and lost it. Oh, I like that. That's kind of interesting. And, 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 and you know, that, that's a very romantic notion. We have a character like this in romantic romanticism called the Byronic Hero. Remember this? We talked about it. The Bi oh, that's right. I always give a lecture on that, too. Um, but the Byronic Hero is someone who has done some kind of taboo sin or he has tasted a forbidden fruit and it cuts him off from human fellowship. And he may, you know, live longer, but it's, it's a kind of misery. So you're sort of not alive, but not dead. You're like the walking dead. Okay? Does, that, does that describe any of the famous monsters that come again and again to movies and books? Yeah, vampires. I mean, this this is a good description of a vampire. Okay, what's that? What's that? Oh, the necromancer. Well, that, that's that's the name of Sauron, actually, of, of Sauron in the Hobbit. He calls him the necromancer. You're right, the one who's been, the the neck the, 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 the what's it called the, um, the, the book of the dead. The ne necromancer. Yeah, I'm trying to get the word out of my right? But yeah, the, uh, of the dead, right? And again, the the the, the uh, the, the, the vampire's life becomes just a, a misery. I mean, some of them get to, you know, have teenage girls in their coffins with them, apparently. But, uh, okay. 
<laughs> Did any of you actually read those novels? Did you see you read them? Nobody, Nobody actually read them. I didn't read them. We're talking about, we're talking about the uh, Twilight, Twilight series. series. You've heard that. that. That's the joke. Twilight. <laughs> I just got a shiver just thinking about it. <laughs> you got a shiver. Uh, interestingly, Clinton, to, to go back to your earlier comment, that the woman who wrote those is actually a Mormon. I don't know if there's Mormon ideas in that or whatever, but uh, the step. Uh, yeah, is a Mormon. Yeah, Isn't that interesting. I haven't read the books, but interesting. They say that despite all the weirdness, the, the the girls don't actually like actually have sex with them or something. Like they they remain pure. Or I don't. I haven't seen them. I couldn't even make it to the movie. <laughs> Very straight stuff. Anyway. That's, that's what I thought somebody said, that there are some. It's like weird stuff and virtuous stuff at the same time. So I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 it's good stuff, right? So they continue on, right? So vampires. What, what, what other things are sort of undead? Yeah, what's that name? Zombies, good. I mean, they, 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 we, we, we get inundated with zombies all the time, right? I'm just glad that this COVID didn't become the zombie apocalypse or something like that. Okay? It still might. Yeah, that's right. That's why, that's why I, I, I haven't got the uh, vaccine yet. <laughs> Turn us all into zombies or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The vaccine, yeah, yeah. There are people and they're like, man, you know, they, they, they like to scare you. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, because apparently the new vaccine does do something to your DNA or the way it works, or RNA. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna be, you know, controlling us from China or something. <laughs> Crazy. No? <laughs> I, I don't think I'm too afraid of that. Oh, really? Yeah, no, I've heard people say it. Yeah, it's funny. I don't know. But but zombies, okay? They are they are undead. Their life is unnaturally extended. But any other monsters? Yeah, the Frankenstein monster is literally an animated corpse. Right? What else is an animated corpse? What's it? <laughs> He's in the <laughs> Poor Amanda. Uh, all right, Amanda, from now on, we're going to call you Corpse Bride. You like the Corpse Bride? <laughs> this poor guy, these guys. No, no, you know you can be, because she is actually very cute. You can be that girl in, uh, what's it called, Nightmare Before Christmas. The one that's always, that's a girl, I think, I think you, that's you more. The girl's always falling apart. What's her name? Sally, yeah. Yeah, she's always coming unstitched, right? Stuff like that. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, it's a cute character, right? Always, uh, you know. Jim Robbins made a bunch of movies where he's, his leading lady is like white as a ghost. He seems to like that. Very strange. Anyway, the... Uh, yeah, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, you look like the girl that was in uh, Sleepy Hollow and stuff like that. They're like, they look so pale. But anyway, the... Uh, but, uh, again, uh, the, the mummy, okay? You ever seen mummy? I mean, the mummy is literally an animated corpse. It can't die. It's, it, and, and, and to a certain extent, the werewolf is also like that, too. Like, it wants to die. Thanks for the bullet, it says. Put me out of my misery. I, they never quite say if, if... But I think the implication is that if, if the werewolf could live forever, or we'll just keep living and stuff, then, of course, you've got the werewolves against the vampires. What was that called? Uh, underground? Underground? No, under... Underworld. Underworld, thank you. I know I was wrong. Underworld. Those 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 movies are, are vampires versus werewolves. You know, they're uh, I, uh, I don't uh, oh. my ex wife, my ex wife, who's mean, vicious little woman, sent with my daughter a tube of something. So my, my ex wife has been cleaning out the garage, and when I divorced her, I just left, left everything. Keeping that captive.
And I'm like, what in the hell is in there? And I forgot that I used to have this thing with buying autographed movie posters. Oh. And so my, my now wife is standing there, and she's wanting to see what's inside this tube. Oh, my gosh. I put it up. It's a giant. It's a giant underworld poster signed by King Beckinsale. Oh my gosh, King Beckinsale! Oh my gosh! Wow. There we go. Uh, there we go. Anthony and Chris, I hope you caught that. <laughs> oh, okay, the theater room. I like that. I like that. Good. But the... Uh, but, 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 but again, it's, it's, you know, you, 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 you get so turned into yourself, you just you sort of disappear. And then this, 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 I mean, and, you know, I don't know if you said this before, but, you know, when God, after, after we fell and were kicked out of the garden, God set up a angel with a swirling sword to prevent us from returning to Eden, lest we do what? Go back to Eden and eat? from the tree of life. Now, in one way, that's a punishment, obviously, but isn't it a blessing? Because if in our fallen state we ate of the fruit of life, we'd be like this. We'd be like, you know, a black rider, like the Nazgul or something like that, or like Gollum, just uh, <laughs> apparently like Clinton's ex-wife. But the... Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've got, I've got an image of, you know, Gollum now or something like that. It's kind of scary. Anyway... <laughs> This has been another episode of the Oprah Winfrey Show, everyone. Okay, anyway. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> hey, it's Master's Art, man, so it's okay. That's the fine art. Anyway, so... Oh, my gosh. Anyway, uh, then we'll go on. Um, and and uh, let's jump to the bottom of page 48. Uh, again, we, we, we see... Oh, well, well, actually, first the middle of 48, because, again, this, this concept is so important. It, it's... When, when you, you seek, seek after forbidden, forbidden knowledge, knowledge, it has a dark side, side right? right? And Adam, Adam you know, know, eating of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Prometheus, Prometheus stealing the fire uh, from the gods. I mean, when you take of forbidden, forbidden knowledge, knowledge, it always cuts you off from people, right? right? And, and we find out that, that look at this, we, before, before we even know, know that Saruman has gone bad, bad in, in the middle of page 48, he, he says, says, maybe, maybe not answer Gandalf, hobbits, hobbits are or were, no, no concern of his, he's talking about the Dark Lord, yet, yet he is great among the wise, he is the chief, he's talking about Saruman now, he is the chief of my order and the head of the council. His knowledge is deep, but his pride has grown with it, and he takes ill any meddling. The lore of the elven rings, great and small, is his province. He has long studied it, seeking the lost secrets of their making. Now, now, we don't know yet that Saruman has gone back. Actually, Gandalf doesn't know that he's really gone over to the dark side. Right? Um, but we have a glimpse of it already that he's obsessed with secrets. Right? And uh, again, there, 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 is, there is trouble coming. Right? Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but if you've seen the first Hobbit movie, <laughs> The Unexpected Journey, um, there is an added scene and an added dialogue where we get to meet what's called the White Council. Those are the people that ended up chasing Sauron out of Mirkwood, out of Dol Guldur, and chased him back to Mordor. And the main people of that are Galadriel, Elrond, Gandalf, and, and, and Saruman. Right? And we see them all. Right? I mean, by then, when was Christopher Lee was like 90 years old by the time he made that movie. Um, and the, uh, you know, we've lost the three Christophers this year. We lost Christopher Lee, we lost Christopher Tolkien, and you know who we just lost? Christopher Plummer. You know that from The Sound of Music? Uh, you know, uh, 
what's his name, uh, uh, Captain Von Trapp, that actor. He just died. He was in his 90s, somewhere, 1993, something in his 90s, early 90s. Um, but anyway, the, uh, there's a scene, do you remember, where he says something like, uh, where, where Saruman wants to trust to power, but Gandalf wants to trust to the friendship of the hobbits and these things, the, the little, little people making little decisions. He says, I'm going to trust that rather than power. I can't remember. It's, it's, it's an added line, but it, but it fits very much into the whole Tolkien stuff. Uh, so we're, we're trying to get glimpses of how Saruman's going bad, right? that he is seeking. And we're going to find out in a moment that Gollum also was someone who loved forbidden secrets. Beware. Right? Um, anyway, he says... Uh, um, then he's, he's able to go, and on the very bottom of page 48, as soon as Bilbo gave up the ring, he felt better at once. But there's only one power in this world that knows all about the rings and their effects. And as far as I know, there is no power in the world that knows all about hobbits. Among the wise, I am the only one that goes in for hobbit lore. Not to mention pipe weed. Uh, an obscure branch of knowledge, but full of surprises. And then we get this wonderful description of, uh, I don't know who this would be, soft as butter they can be, and, and yet, yet sometimes, sometimes as tough as, tough as old tree, tree roots. We, we said already, these, these are the British. British. These, these are the Kentucky British. folk, as we said before, too. Okay? They may seem simple, but they, they are strong and resilient. And they can, you know, hold off. It's just, it's just amazing. It's amazing. Okay. Uh, I don't remember if I said that before, but in Pericles' funeral oration, he said the Athenians have a love of luxury, but it hasn't made them soft. Because when they have to fight, they fall. Right? But they also, they're not like the Spartans living in an armed camp. They can enjoy beautiful things. And in the case of the hobbits, they can eat six meals a day, stuff like that. Any, any of you want to just do that for this class? Eat six meals a day? You going to do that? Okay, good stuff. Anyway. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. A little more sacred geometry. <clears throat> Anthony Roberts stealing your sacred geometry. Flint is just making fun of it. But anyway, the uh, <laughs> I'm speaking for you, Clinton. I know I know what you, I know what you're thinking. I I, I, can, I know what you're thinking there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so look at, the, look at the next page, 49. Again, we need to understand what the true nature of evil is. Okay? The true nature of evil is not, you know, charismatic and exciting and stuff like that. The true nature of evil, the devil is like a nasty, spiteful teenager who would rather break his toys than share them with anyone else. We, we've got to get, I mean, in, in, in some ways, that's why, even though, of course, I love Milton's Paradise Lost, Tolkien does a better job showing us the self-destructive nature of evil. Because in some ways, you could argue that, that Satan comes across as too heroic in, in Paradise Lost. But not here. Oh, my gosh. And we not only see Sauron, but if you want the most pure, the most pure image of evil that only brings misery upon itself, who would that be? Even, Even worse, worse than, than Sauron. Is that? Oh, well, I would do okay. But, but in this book, who embodies no joy, no joy out of the evil? It would be Shelob when we get there. Okay? Just devouring everything, sucking. And, and, and you know, it's just, he understands what, what nature does and what it does to us. Right? Um, Okay. okay, and, and he, he says, look, look what he says, uh, about, about a third of the way down on page 49, he says, Ever since Bilbo left, uh, uh, Gandalf's talking, I have been deeply concerned about you and about all these charming, absurd, helpless hobbits. Does you love Gandalf as a real person? He's very sweet, but he can be like that. Absurd people. I mean, what is the last thing he says before he dies? Fly, you fools! <laughs> wonderful! It's a lady. He really does die, actually. Uh, fly, you fools! I mean, it's wonderful. Fool of a tooth! Throw yourself, yourself in next time and spare us all the trouble. I mean, <laughs> wonderful, you know, crotchety old guy. Anyway, 
He says, uh, it would be a grievous blow to the world if the dark power overcame the Shire, if all your kind, jolly, stupid, bold... I mean, but he loves them too, right? Uh, Bolgers, hornblowers, boffins, brace girdles, and the rest, not to mention the ridiculous Bagginses, became enslaved. Frodo Shudder, but why should we be? And, and why should he want such a slavery? What, what, why, why does the sour want to enslave us? What, what good are we going to do? Maybe he wants taters. What do we... To, to tell you the truth, replied Gandalf, I believe that hitherto, hitherto, mark you, up until now, he, Sauron, has entirely overlooked the existence of hobbits. You should be thankful. But your safety has passed. He does not need you. He has many more useful servants. But he won't forget you again. And hobbits as miserable slaves would please him far more than hobbits happy and free. There is such a thing as malice and revenge. All right. Aside from the former Mrs. Millsap, do you understand? <laughs> do you under? I mean, have you ever seen this? Okay. That kind of spitefulness and malice that it, it doesn't even help the person. I mean, it's terrible to say, but that kind of evil is in the world. And the really scary thing is that that kind of evil is potentially in all of us. Right? Do you remember when, we'll see it in a second, but when Gandalf tells Frodo the story about Gollum, how Smeagol became Gollum and who Gollum was, do you remember the one part that Frodo, like, no, that's not true. Good. He tells him these river folk are like hobbits. And notice, no, 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 they're not like us at all. I mean, even there, it's just, no, I don't want to admit that sort of kinship. But we, we find out later, why do you think it was that when they did their riddle game, they both seemed to understand the rules and everything like that, that there is a similarity there. And you, you don't want to admit that. I don't want to be like that. Um, but we do have that potential uh, dragging us in. Like I said, one of the first things that, that, that attracted me to, to Christianity as a worldview is we're made in God's image but fallen. I can't see anything else that explains the incredible potential for good and self-sacrifice and the incredible potential we all have. Not just for evil, but just nastiness. Okay? You're not even like, okay, I did evil and now I've stolen you know, $10 million and all. I mean, it's just like, it doesn't even do us any good somehow. Uh, that that kind of malice exists. That kind of revenge. That that is that is Satan. Right? Satan means accuser. Right? Shatan means accuser. A uh, slanderer uh, that does that. Uh, by, by the way, did, did any of you ever get that feeling in the land of Mordor? The the, the poem on, on the next page. The poem page fifty. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. Where, 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 where does that image, that sound in our head? We've all heard it many times. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Right? The, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, I'm sure you know, that, that cadence is going to be in the back of his head every time you, you hear that, uh, that, the deep, dark valley. Right? Uh, but we understand, right? So three rings were made for the elven kings, right? And we'll we'll find out by the end that that does anybody does anybody know who three, who were the three people that have the rings? Gandalf has one. Galadriel and Elrond, right? Have the, the three rings, okay? Um, and again, the 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 elves have not been corrupted by the rings. But, but the, the rings have encouraged them because the greatest temptation for an elf is to keep everything exactly the same and never let it change. Right? Keep the woods the same and just stay like that. that, that that's their temptation. Uh, the dwarves, they never, they never join the enemy. The dwarves are tough. They never join the enemy. They, 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 you know, they're, they're the hillbillies. And they don't give in, okay? Like, uh, uh, my family's from Sparta, but above Sparta and Mani are the real tough guys that we make fun of. And they were the last people to fall to the fascists. But they were also the last people to accept Christianity. And they're, they're always the last. They're, those are the hillbillies of the, that, that are from Macedonia. I was in the great, uh, the great Macedonians. Uh, they're tough, right? Um, so it didn't corrupt them in the sense. They never followed the Dark Lord. But it drove them farther underground, increasing their greed for, for, you know, diamonds and gold and all that stuff, and the mithril, the true silver, going deeper and deeper and deeper. The ones that were really corrupted the most were the men, because we give in too much to that desire for power and those nine 
lords, okay, uh, the, the nine oh, that were that were corrupted. Good stuff, man. Anyway, uh, let's see. Now, okay, next next page, uh, page fifty one. Here's a phrase that uh, is extremely well used in the movie. Uh, man, it was so cool. I was. Uh, I was, I was talking to the provost. So our new provost is, is an engineering uh, teacher, uh, Dr. Knapper. And he's doing a great job. And I told him, I said, sometimes the engineers are better friends of the humanities than anybody else. Because engineers understand why humanities are important. Okay, they, they need the other dimension. But it was really funny because we were talking about problems and stuff. And he was saying to me, you know, I try to explain to people that, you know, we, we can't choose. There's certain things we can't choose. We can't choose when we're born. We can't choose if we're male or female. We can't choose where we're born. We can't choose if our parents are nice or mean or how much, you know, but we, we can choose what will we do with it. And I said to him, do you know that you just quoted the Lord of the Rings? And then I quoted this to him. So I, was just, I just met with him on Monday. That was pretty cool. So it's like, yeah, I don't know if he was consciously quoting it, but this is so important. Uh, okay, first of all, we find out that, uh, uh, let me see, we're in 51, third of the way paid. But last night I told you of Sauron the Great, the Dark Lord, the rumors that you have heard are true. He has indeed arisen again and left his hold in Mirkwood, because that's where the White Council had driven him out 61 years ago now. But, um, and he returned to his ancient fastness in the Dark Tower of Mordor, okay, in the east, in the southeast. That name, even you hobbits have heard of, like a shadow on the borders of old stories. Always after a defeat and a respite, the shadow takes another shape and grows again. Tolkien said in one of his letters, all wars are eventually lost. He calls it the long defeat. But he still was not a pessimist. Uh, as Aragorn will say to Arwen when he's dying, this is in the appendices, he says, in sorrow we must go, but not in despair. That's, That's the mood of the Lord of the Rings. I think I've said it before, it's an elegiac mood, like the word elegy. Uh, it's, 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 it's a, there's a sort of sadness, a melancholy, a going away, a loss of, of gold, but it's not despair. It's not giving into complete cynicism and despair. But evil never dies. It keeps coming back. I said, Castro did finally die, didn't he? Yeah, I think he did. It seemed like he would never die. Fidel Castro? And now his brother is like still around, I guess. And nobody even sees these people just holding on. Right? Uh, and then Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I. So do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given. And that's like the heart of the first movie. Because we hear it early on, and then Frodo hears it in his head at the very end when he's making the decision. And it gets right to that. That's, that's what we have to choose. Right? What, what will we do with the time that is given to us? Right? Now, some people are called to be missionaries on the other side of the world. But a lot of people are just called to do what they can to help the people in their sphere. Okay? Your peers, your whatever. You, that, that, that's, that's, that's your job to reach out and not worry. Now, nowadays, we, we we're creating people who, who weep and moan and are so worried about all the earthquakes that are happening on the other side of the world and aren't worrying about being nice to their family. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, yeah, I mean, we should feel bad, but our focus is now. Uh, there's an old phrase, charity begins at home. You start with those that are closest to you and move out from that. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, he says... So do all who live to see such times. Does that sound like a famous verse from the Bible? For such a time as this? Yeah, the book of Esther, right? Uh, in the book of Esther, um, the, uh, you know, she's being called to risk everything for her people, the Jewish people. And, you know, Mordecai, her uncle, you know, maybe it was for such a time as this that you were put in this place. Right? And in some ways, the Lord of the Rings is like the Book of Esther, because the Book of Esther almost didn't make it into the Bible, because what is never actually mentioned in the Book of Esther? God. Not, not even the generic name God is mentioned at all, much like Yahweh. They're, they're never even mentioned, but God is behind all of them. The word here is providence. Okay? God is behind everything that happens. Um, uh, as, as we'll see, he'll make a few more comments about that. Uh, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And already, Frodo, our time is beginning to look black. The enemy is fast becoming very strong, which is maybe why I shouldn't have wasted 17 years. But anyway, I'm not going to be upset. 
It's all, all right. right. As frustrated as you get with Gandalf, you're going to be much more frustrated with the elves who never give you a straight answer to anything. Kind of like a... Yeah, he's trying to work. The elves are just, you know... Elves are kind of like guidance counselors. In other words, useless. Anyway, the... Um, sorry, but they are useless. <laughs> I'm just having fun here, you know. Anyway, all of this is being recorded, too. But anyway, the... Um, Imagine anybody wanting to watch these things. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I, was, I was in England speaking or something like that, and, and we were in a bus, and the bus driver was going on and on about something, and one American guy said, Tell us how you really feel. And that poor guy was so confused. You know, he, the Americans say that all the time. He's like, what? He thought he was being insulted. He didn't, poor guy didn't you know what to say. It was funny. Anyway, got to remember, not everybody understands our colloquialisms. Anyway, the... Uh, Okay, where was I? So, so, um, so, so uh, again, we, we hear about the ring rates, all that sort of stuff, right? All, all these different things. Uh, let's, let's move a little bit. Um, okay, here, on page 53, the very top of page 53, here's where we'll, we'll see what I mentioned before about Gollum, or Smeagol at that point. He also has a lust for forbidden knowledge. It says, on the very, very top of the page, the most inquisitive and curious-minded of that family was called Smeagol. He was interested in roots and beginnings. He dived into deep pools. He burrowed under trees and growing plants. He tunneled into green mounds. And he ceased to look up at the hilltops or the leaves on trees or the flowers opening in the air. His head and his eyes were downward. Always. You're okay. By the way, always looking down, never looking up, okay? Try looking up to the hills and whatnot. And, and you know, uh, you may have a little, you know, Plato always talks about how, you know, God put our head and our brain at the top so it's up, not like animals whose heads, generally speaking, their heads are down, um, trying to move upward and grow upward. Right? Um, and we, we get the whole story, it's there, uh, 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 about, again, he's stranded. Like I said, it happens so fast. Uh, a few paragraphs down. Oh, are you indeed my love? And he caught Deagle by the throat and strangled him. Because, because the, the gold, gold looks so bright and beautiful. Then he put the ring in his finger. Because, because the gold looks so bright and beautiful. Does that have an echo from the Bible? Very good. And when she saw that the apple... Good. Good, good, good. Good to look at, good for eating, and good to acquire knowledge. She took it, ate of it, and gave it to her husband also, right? It, it's definitely an echo of that. It's beautiful. It's, it's shiny. Shiny thing. Do you like shiny things, Amanda? When you were little? <laughs> shiny things. I remember my daughter liking shiny things. The, uh, and he says, No one ever found out what became of Deagle. He was murdered far from home and his body was cunningly hidden. But Smeagol returned alone and he found that none of his family could see him when he was wearing the ring. He was very pleased with his discovery and he concealed it and he used it to find out secrets. And he put his knowledge to crooked and malicious uses. He became sharp-eyed and keen-eared for all that was hurtful. The ring had given him power according to his stature. It is not to be wondered at that he became very unpopular and was shunned. So it gives him power, it gives him wisdom, it gives him invisibility, but he loses all fellowship. He's cut off, he's an, an exile, he's sent away. Right? I don't know if you know this, but in uh, Herodotus, uh, we're told the story of the Ring of Gyges, how he found this ring that made him invisible. And then it's used again in Plato's Republic. You know, what would you do if you had a ring of invisibility? Do all of you know who Steve Martin is? Not around as much, but a very, very funny comedian. And I remember a skit that he did where he's uh, by the beach and there's all these beautiful girls, or beach volleyball players or something like that. And Steve is kind of a nerdy guy. And he jumps in the middle of the girls and says, Hi girls, how you doing? Hi. And they just look right through him. Completely ignore him. And he says, wait a minute, I must be invisible. He looks at the camera. Think of all the great things I can do. I can stop crime. I can help people. And then there's a cut. And in the next scene, he's being dragged out of the girl's locker room saying, but I'm invisible. I'm invisible. So that, that pretty much is a comment on the whole invisibility thing. Okay? How would it be used? Okay. And uh, <laughs> gotta watch out. <laughs> um, uh, uh, by the way, just if you want to underline it, towards the bottom of page 54, <clears throat> um, second paragraph from the bottom, 
I can believe that Gollum was connected with hobbits, however distantly. I can't believe it. What an abominable notion. That's, that's, that's where uh, Frodo reacts. No, he, he can't be like us. No way. He is. Those river folk are very similar. Right? Um, okay. Um, <coughs> I want you to see something on page 55. This is very important for life as well. I want you to remember this. About the third paragraph. In the end, all the, quote, great secrets under the mountains that... that, 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 that uh, Gollum was looking for, all those great secrets had turned out to be just empty night. There was nothing more to find out, nothing worth doing, only nasty, furtive eating and resentful remembering. He was altogether wretched. He hated the dark and he hated light more. He hated everything and the ring most of all. What do you mean? Surely the ring was his precious and the only thing he cared for, but if he hated it, why didn't he get rid of it? You ought to begin to understand, Frodo, after all you've heard. He hated it and he loved it, as he hated and loved himself. He could not get rid of it. He had no will left in the matter. Wow. C.S. Lewis teaches that sin dehumanizes us. It sucks out our life and our personality, leaving us as a shell until there's nothing left. Man, furtive, empty. You need to understand that. Uh, how, how many of you saw the movie um, uh, Schindler's List? Schindler's List, you remember that movie? Right. You know, there, there's two characters there, main characters. One, of course, is Oscar Schindler, who was not a particularly nice guy, but ended up doing this incredible self-sacrificial thing, played by uh, Liam Neeson, right? And then, wait, yeah, Liam Neeson was that. And then, played by Ralph Fiennes, was the commandant of the uh, concentration camp. I don't remember his name, right? And just so evil, and in one sense, in the in the you know, the the, con the guy that runs the camp, we have the mystery of evil, and Oscar Schindler, we have the mystery of good, and I think you realize at the end that even though we seem to think the mystery of evil is more interesting, right? We love to give people you know Oscars if they play evil characters and serial killers, and but but no, it is the mystery of good that's full full. It's the mystery of evil is nothing. It's just. Dirt and ashes and on and on and grumbling. There's, there's no wisdom there. Right? The real wisdom is in. And that's why, you know, what C.S. Lewis did in creating Aslan, it wasn't that hard because it was Jesus, but still, creation of a almost a wholly good character. There's not many others like that. Uh, in, 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 I mean, something that is just so good. It's not easy to create. And I, I wish we would, you know, give Oscars to people who play good characters. Because sometimes it's easier, harder to play a good character than an evil character. Evil is just easy. You get yourself into the cramp and you just do it, right? Uh, but I don't know why we're fascinated by it. What, what do you think? I guess we did. That's true. Back, back, back then. Yeah, I guess it's different. That's right. Like Sergeant York, right? He got a, he got a, uh, you know, Oscar. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Cary, uh, Cl Cary Grant, Clark Gable, Gary Cooper. There we go. That sounds similar. Gary Cooper. I think got an Oscar for that. Also for for playing uh, High Noon. Yeah. You seen High Noon? Yeah, that's a good movie. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's true. You're right, yeah. Like I said, uh, less. I mean, now we're just we're fascinated by anybody that plays someone that's twisted in some way or another. I don't know the fascination of it. Uh, but again, the mystery of evil is finally empty. It leads nowhere. It's the mystery of good that illuminates. Wow. Um... The ring of power looks after itself. It will finally, you know, it, it, it left him one after the other, left after the other, back, right? Um, he says, it is no laughing matter, Gandalf, not for you, uh, said Gandalf, not for you. It was the strangest event in the whole history of the ring so far. Bilbo's arrival just at that time and putting his hand on it blindly in the dark. There was more than one power at work, Frodo. The ring was trying to get back to its master. It had slipped from Isildur's hand and betrayed him. This is a, okay, the, the, the guy that cut the ring off of Sauron and defeated him at the end of the Second Age, had a chance to destroy it in the cracks of doom, but instead it's mine. And he was being attacked and waylaid by orcs. He put it on to make him invisible. He went in the water. It fell from him. He became visible and he was killed with arrows. By the way, Boromir is also killed with arrows, interestingly. The guy who tries to steal the ring. The, uh, it's always the, 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 the favorite time when we watch Lord of the Rings together and, and Boromir says, you know, strange, uh, what is he said? Uh, strange how so much, uh, what is he strange how so much, you know, uh, 
trouble can come out of something so small. And then I stopped and say, kind of like my daughter. It was like five months. So it was always, you might, you might have witnessed it. Did, did you ever make a Lord of the Rings marathon? I don't think you did. Okay, but you've done one. Okay. It's been a while since we've done Well, the last four or five years, I've taken the kids and we've spent New Year's Eve with my, my parents in Florida. So, because we, we used to do it. Although we did it a couple times. Uh, for Fourth of July, but we started on July third. That's the way to do it because everybody's off on July fourth, and we did that. So we've done it a few other times, but but you know, New Year's Eve is the best way. Best way to bring in the New Year. Um, he says uh, betrayed him. Uh, then when a chance came, it caught poor Deagle, and he was murdered. And after that, Gollum, and it devoured him. It could make no further use of him. He was too small and mean. And as long as it stayed with him, he would never leave his deep pool again. So now, when its master was awake once more and sending out his dark thought from Mirkwood, it abandoned Gollum, only to be picked up by the most unlikely person imaginable. Bilbo from the Shire, the unlikely hero. Behind that, there was something else at work, beyond any design of the ringmaker. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring, and not by its maker, in which case you also were meant to have it. And, and that, that may be an encouraging thought. thought. Why, why is that an encouraging thought? You see what he's saying? Good. Okay, good. That there's something. It's, it's something beyond its maker, beyond Sauron. There's some force, it's providence, that's beyond it, that's orchestrating this. It's like that gives us some hope, you know, and it's just a glimmer of hope. But it's something we can go on. There never was much hope, just a fool, so, uh, as Gandalf says in, in the movie. The, uh, and, uh, but, but anyway, they, they, they talk about Gollum, how they capture him. Let me finish this very long chapter here. Um, look, look at page uh, 59. Do we need a stretch? Why don't you get up and stretch? You can take a stretch break. Anybody want to come and say anything to Chris or, or Anthony? Oh! Wait, is it somebody's birthday? My wife's birthday. Oh, sure. oh, we're keeping you away from your wife? Yeah, my wife's birthday today. And the kids brought down a cake and they had it hidden up in the room. So my other kids videotaped it like this. Oh! <laughs> 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 my son said, Tommy, you left the cake in the box with the. <laughs> Tool. Oh, 
Oh yeah, Alex Gray. Alex Gray. Yeah, he's I like. I Dude, like he's him. a beast at that stuff. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to go to one of his openings. I think in three years ago in New York, where he created a, a huge facility. You know, architectural design based off of his art. Is, is that the House of Mirrors? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I had a couple of buddies. I used to be in a full cover band in the back of my oh, day. Oh, nice. I still remember uh -huh. that. Oh, all right. I, those guys, I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> but they were like, that's my church, man. Oh. <laughs> that's amazing. But he said when they were up there, Alex Gray's wife read the Book of Esther out loud, like in a little meditation area. Mm -hmm. stuff. It's really weird. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah. yeah, he looks like a roadie for pool. That's right. He looks like a roadie in general. Yeah, he, um, his artwork, though, is pretty fascinating to look at. He just kind of get lost in it. All the symbolism? Yeah. All the pantheon? What's that? The sanctuary for the people that are in the middle. It has all the islands going around it. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. It looks like a big dish or something. Yeah. It's been like 15 years since I kept up with him, so I just don't tell him. Yeah, it's just sort of interesting. Yeah, that's all the sacred mirrors. Yeah, yeah. 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 all the sacred mirrors. Yeah. 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 See, like, his, his artwork, if you're looking at it, like, most of it is the size of a wall. Like, it's huge. Yeah. This is crazy. I'm not, I'm a, I'm not an art, I'm a musician, and I really appreciate art. I'm actually like self-teaching myself art appreciation. Right? Yeah. You came for the right place. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm like, uh, Francis Schaefer got me into it. I was reading some of his stuff. Francis Schaefer is an apologist. Yeah, he was really good at doing cultural apologetics, and he like, he used art quite a bit. Right, right. His, uh, so for her birthday, do you sing? Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah blue trunk. Uh, but our, our family two. sings happy birthday as horribly as you can. Oh, oh, oh that's so, so everyone starts at different times. See how much how, how, how much that key. It has to be the worst <laughs> rendition <laughs> you've <laughs> ever heard to be the right one for us. That's good. That's a good tradition. Yeah, that's a shame. And of course, you you know you you got to work with Nancy Tracy. We're working with him. Yeah, pretty cool. And I found out that like his ideas about art, like there are other Christians that were like, well, he was totally wrong about this, this, and this. It's like an ongoing debate. Oh yeah, no, he you know well, no, like you said, he's trying to come up with a huge overarching thing. Yeah, a lot of stuff he's he's doing. He kind of fits in there. Yeah, yeah, he tried. Yeah, some, yeah, some. But he, he was an important beginning to that. He was one of the first ones to really try to do that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so so it's like going to the town. Of the of the of the first thing we need. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. 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 Like modern art in the something the right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You want to get a lot of expensive Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one of these things we'll create. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 I still like the Seamus Haney. I mean, now, it isn't the most accurate, but I think it's the most energetic, you know. Uh, Seamus Haney. He's, a, he's actually was a famous Irish poet himself.
H E N E Y. H E A N E Y, I think it is. Seamus. S E A M U S. Seamus Heaney. We use that one, Runners. You saw that? Pretty good. Oh, no, he wants it. Terrible. Huh. Oh, that's right. You're looking for uh, the, the great books of the Western uh, intellectual tradition? He's got most of them. Well, maybe, maybe bring them on show or bring a list so you can see. Yeah. Is it, they, they, it's, it's, <laughs> so we would have two sets of the same thing. Oh, yeah, it's good. Well, okay, let's see. The protect what's it? Times you just had to shake your head in the last two years. <laughs> you, you chose well to have Robert as a, as a, as a uh, sweet mate, or whatever you want to call it. He's good. He doesn't drive you crazy. He's he's behaved. My first one, I actually tried when I was really young and hard, but my first voice I ever tried to do was Johnny Carson. Oh, did you do it? I was like, I was in love whenever he would do the great Karnak. Oh, oh, yes. So I would always like make punchlines, like cut like, downs for my brothers, brothers, and then I would answer. Oh, an answer, that's right, that's right, yep. Yeah. And then I would say with, with the cut down when I was doing it. The guy was amazing. My brothers never got it, you know. But, uh, it did me no good all through high school. None of my friends or figures knew who Johnny Carson was. It was not fun to them whatsoever. <laughs> Then I got I got into college and I was sitting on the Dean of Fine Arts couch, like waiting for him to give me a signature on some forms. And he said something that sounded Ed McManish. He said like oh, you know, a Kyle or something like that. Oh, it's a, yeah. He, he, he was very jovially saying hello or something like that. And as soon as he hung up, I just like ripped into an impersonation of Tony Carson. Oh, was great. And his face, his face like melted and he was like, oh my god, it's great. <laughs> I think if you're in the studio audience, I think maybe he warms them up too or something. We don't see that part, but I wonder if he like warmed up the audience or something. But yeah, here's Johnny. <laughs> All right, page 59, a few more very important passages here. The, uh, um, uh, about the middle of the page. But this is terrible, cried Photo. Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really afraid. What am I to do? What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy, not to strike without need. And he has been well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure that he took so little hurt from the evil and escaped in the end because he began his ownership of the ring so. With pity. Now, you can decide as you read this uh, book if this is, like, truly Christian or irresponsible because they keep forgiving Saruman, who keeps causing more and more problem, more and more trouble. I mean, but Tolkien is pretty consistent with his ethos right to the end. Uh, but it's just interesting to see how you react to it as you go through because, I mean, they also capture Gollum several times and let him go, right? Um, now, again, if it wasn't for the pity, Gollum wouldn't have been there to bring about the happy ending at the end, right? Um, Frodo would have been a new Dark Lord. Elijah Wood is a Dark Lord. You know? Anyway, the, uh, 
Well, well I am so, so sorry, sorry, but I'm frightened and I do not feel any pity for Gollum. You have not seen him. No, no and I don't want to. I can't understand, can understand you. Do you mean to say that you and the elves have let him live on after all those horrible deeds? Now, at any rate, he is as bad as an orc and just an enemy. He deserves death. He deserves it. I dare say he does. <laughs> Many that live deserve death. Some that die deserve life. Can you give it to him? But don't be too eager to deal out death with judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. I have not much hope that Gollum could be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. And he is bound up with the fate of the ring. My heart tells me that he has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end. And when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many. Yours not least. Pity, now, pity can be a negative emotion, right? P people use pity to manipulate their family and stuff, but pity becomes a very powerful force throughout, both in The Hobbit, but even more in The Lord of the Rings. Just like, I mean, one of the things that Christianity did is it took the old heroes, the Achilles, the you know Achilles, Odysseus, and things like that, but it gave them a new quality of pity, of meekness. Can somebody tell me what the difference is between meekness and weakness? But have you preached a sermon on that? You might cloak your power, right? I can't know. You can pray for somebody's destruction, and Jesus addressed that in the gospel. Right. Well, let's rain fire down on these people. Oh, right, yeah, that's right, yeah. And Jesus is like, no, 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 And that's it. Blessed are the me. I mean, when they shall inherit the earth. There, there's the uh, uh, the musical Camelot, where uh, where uh, what's his name, the bad guy. Uh, ah, what's the bad guy's name? Mordred. Mordred says, uh, um, "It's not the meek the earth inherit; it's the dirt." <laughs> right? Because uh, he's fighting against the seven deadly virtues, as he calls them. But that, that's that, that's what's added. That's not what's in the heroes of you know Greco-Roman heroes. This idea of meekness, of humility, of restraint, of pity. This is something that makes a different kind of hero. And of course, it's very powerfully done here uh, in, in The Lord of the Rings. And, and again, the pity that's shown by many, many characters that we are not in control. It is not for us to deal out death right? because we don't see all ends. And you're going to see, well, we'll talk about this a lot as we get there, that in this book, it's not always good to see ahead because seeing is perilous. Watch out. And the weird thing is that we'll, we'll see it. It's, it's, it's quite a bit later. But at one point, Gandalf will say that because we don't see ahead, we have more hope. <laughs> and you, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you find something? Oh, okay. Let's we'll see. Oh, that's a nice way to put it. And we see it. And we see, you know, we see Gandalf. There's like this depth of, of power to him, but he very rarely shows it. There's one point when he laughs, and Pippin imagines his laughter just, you know, bringing everything back to life, sort of, the power of that laugh. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, um, all the same, even if Bilbo could not kill Gollum, I wish he had not kept the ring. I wish he had never found it, and that I had not got it. Why didn't you let me keep it? Why didn't you make me throw it away or destroy it? Let you. And of course, in, in the movie, we had that great moment where Gimli's like, I'll destroy it! You know, he takes his axe, <laughs> shivers his axe all over the place. Really cool stuff. Yeah. 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 That's right. Just take it away from me. Take it away from me. I guess you know the dwarves mean Gimli. I mean, like I said, the dwarves aren't really. They, 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 you can't corrupt the dwarves. You, you also, you know, can't get them to do what you want either. But I mean, you know, they're they're tough and they're not going to fight for the bad guys. But wow, Robert, you're you're not forging a one ring, are you? You just keep doing some. You think you think okay? <laughs> Watch out. Anyway, the um, uh, where are we? So uh, uh, look at the next page, page sixty, uh, second to last paragraph. 
Frodo drew the ring out of his pocket again and looked at it. It now appeared plain and smooth, because when you throw it in the fire, that's when you see the letters. It's okay, it's quite cool. It now appeared plain and smooth, the gold looked very fair and pure, and Frodo thought how rich and beautiful was its color, how perfect was its roundness, it was an admirable thing, and altogether precious. There's that same echo of, of Eve holding the apple and seeing its, its beauty and, and good for the tasting and things like that. It's just amazing. Um, uh, uh, then on the next page, 61, uh, poor, 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 Gant, poor Frodo. I, I, I do really, this is, a, this is a, let me see, yeah, about a third of the way down. I do really wish to destroy it, cried Frodo, or, well, to have it destroyed. I am not made for perilous quests. I wish I had never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? Such questions cannot be answered. You may be sure that it was not for any merit that others do not possess, not for power or wisdom in any right, but you have been chosen, and you must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. Why did God choose Israel? Why did God choose David? Right? What does Tevye say about being the chosen people? God, I know it's an honor to be the chosen people. But, but couldn't you choose someone else once in a while? <laughs> See Fiddler on the Roof? That's what Debbie says. Um, but, but again, th this is the mystery of chosenness. Okay? Um, but, but I have so little of any of these things. You are wise and powerful. Will you not take the ring? No. No, cried Gandalf. With that power, I should have power too great and terrible. And over me, the ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. His eyes flashed and his face was lit as by a fire. Do not tempt me. For I do not wish to become like the Dark Lord himself. Yet the way of the ring to my heart is by pity, pity for weakness and the desire of strength to do good. Do not tempt me. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe, unused. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. I shall have such need of it. Great perils lie before me. He would try to use the ring for good and would be a worse tyrant. C.S. Lewis once said, the worst uh, tyrants are the religious tyrants. Why? Because they're doing it for your own good. At least a guy that just wants money will take a vacation now and then. But if I'm doing it for your good, I'm not going to stop until I've made you into that. Okay? Re-education camps, the kind of stuff we saw uh, in the 20th century. And they see again, hopefully not in this country, but we'll see. Uh, watch out. Because you, 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 it is an altogether evil force. It cannot be used for good. It will corrupt you. Right? Uh, does anybody know what I mean if I say uh, uh, do, uh, uh, avoid, avoid an Egyptian alliance? You get a biblical reference to that, Bill? You get it? Right? God told his people, you know, you know Judah was in, in trouble, the, the, low, the southern kingdom. And, and they wanted to ally with Egypt to help them against Babylon. And plagues. And God said, don't do that. And he uses one of my favorite metaphors. He says, uh, Egypt is like a broken reed. I said, bamboo? And what happens if you lean against a broken bamboo? I mean, it shreds you to pieces. I mean, that's like, it's like razor sharp bamboo. Um, and, and don't do that. Okay, this is, this is, those of you that remember Narnia, uh, uh, what would have happened if, uh, if Diggory had brought the, the, the apple back and gave it to her, his mother? The apple would have healed her. Remember? But a time would have come when both you and your mother would have agreed it would have been better to die in that illness. Until it's just one of the most incredibly mature uh, challenges to give to a child reader. But again, it, it, it's, it's, the, uh, it's called the, uh, what is it called, the uh, in, uh, in deplorable word. Watch out. The, the, the evil witch who becomes the white witch uses that word to destroy every living thing except herself. So be careful. There is a certain power you cannot use. Uh, you, know, they, 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 you know, the ends do not justify the means. Uh, so be careful of these alliances. And again, they went to find their help and they, they were destroyed. As I mentioned, Egypt was their most ancient enemy. <laughs> so be careful. Uh, uh, okay, um, I should like... Okay, it goes on to page... Uh, uh, let me see, page 62, at the top there. I hope so, said Frodo. But, but I, I hope, hope that you may find some other better keeper soon. But, but in the meanwhile, it seems that I am a danger, a danger to all that live near me. I cannot keep the ring and stay here. I ought to leave Bag End, leave the Shire, leave everything and go away. He's ready. 
I should like to save the Shire if I could, though there have been times when I thought the inhabitants too stupid and dull for words. You sound like Gandalf right now. And I felt that... Have you felt, have you felt this? As you leave? As you left, as you left Kentucky? Did you feel it? <laughs> Oh, oh, no, 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 I didn't think about that. That's right, yeah. He says, oh, oh and it felt that an earthquake or an invasion of dragons might be good for them. <laughs> there you go, right? But I don't feel like that now. I feel that as long as the Shire lies behind safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable. I shall know that somewhere there is a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there again. Of course, I have sometimes thought of going away, but I imagine that as a kind of holiday, a, a series of adventures, like Bilbo's, or, or better, ending in peace. But this would mean exile. A flight from danger into danger, drawing it after me. And I suppose I must go alone if I am to do that and save the Shire. But I feel very small, very uprooted, and, well, desperate. The enemy is so strong and terrible. Look at that Unbelievable courage, right? You remember, you remember when, when, when God was going to send the, the Jews against that enemy and he kept whittling them down and whittling them down? Remember the, the ones that you know, drank water like they were a deer or something? Like um, because he, you know, he wants to show... His, His power, power. By, by using the smallest, and the people will know it's God, right? Um, he says, uh, he did not tell Gandalf, but as he was speaking, a great desire to follow Bilbo flamed up in his heart, to follow Bilbo and even perhaps to find him again. It was so strong that it overcame his fear. So the whole mixture of joy and desire and fear, and yet there's this sudden you know, understanding that as long as the Shire's safe, it's okay. I will go. I'll leave it. I'll go into exile. My dear Frodo, this is the movie, hobbits really are amazing creatures. You can learn all there is to know about them ways in a month, and yet after a hundred years, they can still surprise you. Wonderful. Like, this is one of the great creations. And it, they're, the funny thing is, it's a great creation, but I mean, they're just small people, right? And they, they are like people we know, but I mean, he's just created a whole um, community. And he's shown us that a lot of them are weak and foolish and stupid, but they're capable of this incredible strength to rise up and, like I said, in, 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 in a way, the, this is the common English people that just stood up and held off Hitler all by themselves for a while. Amazing. It's beautiful. And off he goes. And then, of course, we find out who's been listening. Who's been eavesdropping? I've been dropping no eaves! So don't turn, turn me into nothing unnatural! <laughs> But he does say something interesting on page 63, second to the last paragraph. I didn't hear nothing right like in the movie. Well, I heard a deal that I didn't rightly understand about an enemy and rings and Mr. Bilbo, sir, and dragons and a fiery mountain and elves, sir. I listened to because I couldn't help myself, if you know what I mean. Lord bless me, sir. But I do love tales of that sort, and I believe them too, whatever Ted may say. We meet Ted Sandyman a little bit in the beginning, and we're going to meet him at the end in what's called the Scouring of the Shire. And there's a difference. He is, he's willing to believe things, Sam, which doesn't mean he's simple-minded. He's actually very strong and very practical. He is Sancho Panza to Frodo's more idealistic Don Quixote, but, but, but he still believes, right? He's still childlike. And, and then, wonderful thing. They, look, look at how the chapter ends. Me, me, sir, cried Sam, springing up like a dog and fighting for a walk. Me, go and see elves and all. Hooray, he shouted, and then burst into tears. There's something so strong and yet childlike about Sam that's just beautiful. And I said before, he's based on Batman, not Batman. That's the superhero we made fun of before. But the Batman, those were the, the people that helped the officers during World War I and would do all sorts of things for them. And, 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 and that was very much Sam. As, and Tolkien says that in his letter. Sam was a tribute to that. So anyway, off he goes. Oh my gosh, there's so much to say. But they, they meet up with Mary and Pippin. But one of the things I want to say here is, and it took me a while to pick up on this, I really think a good way to understand Book one, which really, really moves slowly, okay? Until it really starts picking up speed once they get to Rivendell. But I really think, I, I didn't see this in any Tolkien's letters, but it's interesting that the many different things that our heroes, particularly Frodo, faces as a warm-up until they get to Rivendell, to me, they all have a sense of the fears of childhood. Can you think of anything that happens in book one? Even, even before they meet Aragorn, can you think of anything that happens to them that, that ties in with childhood fears? Oh, 
Oh, the barrel whites you think okay, so when, when they're in the old forest, right? Right? And and they're they're, they're like literally the, the boogeyman. Okay? They're like ghosts that you're afraid of as a child sleeping in your bed, right? And they you terrified of clowns? The clown sleeping in your bed or something like that. <laughs> and and uh, but, but these are I mean, of course anybody's gonna be afraid, but they're they're sort of like childhood fears. The fear of the, the boogeyman coming to get you in the night, the cold fingers reaching out. What about the forest itself, the old forest? What what, what does that sort of represent to you? What what does what 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 does the forest represent in terms of archetypal fears? Okay. It's the unknown. Very good. And the forest is always. Uh, do you do you know what famous stories are set in the Black Forest of Germany? You said it. good. The stories of the the brothers Grimm. Okay, I love the brothers Grimm story. The brothers Grimm. Yeah. No? And the uh, the uh, there's a crazy movie about them made by that crazy Terry Gilliam from the. Uh, it's called Brothers Grimm. It's kind of fun. Uh, it's, it's not. Yeah, yeah it was, it's still it's fun. It's it's different, but it, a lot of it works, and it does capture some of those fears. You know, so, what, what do you have to encounter when you go into the deep, thick wood? What do you encounter? The unknown, which is sometimes right. What makes it scary when you go into a deep, deep wood? It's dark, but it blocks out even during the day. It's blocking out the sun with the canopy of trees, and when you're in a dark wood, you never know what's at your elbow. You might turn. Like the, the fears, and it is often. You get scared right now. There we go. Okay. You know. You know what that means when you get that. You know that sudden shiver. It means that somebody has stepped on your grave. You heard that? You heard that? You ever that? Stepped on your grave. He scared my kids with that. Yeah. Anyway, the. Uh, we scare kids. I had a friend a long time ago whose mother, you know, you know, the, you, you know, the, the thing about the, the food that drops on the floor, you can't eat it, uh, and, and the mother didn't want the kids to do that, so she told them when food falls on the floor, the devil comes up and kisses it. The poor kid thought the devil lived under his house. You know? Don't scare him that much, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, they're going to five. Just eat it. Come there's, there's, there's too many in your family. We can't waste food. Just eat it. Okay, there we go. Brush it off. Give it to your brother. But the um... <laughs> but but so so think about it. You're, you're facing the unknown. Sometimes in the woods, you meet what you're most afraid of. Of the nine Star Wars movie, which is the most archetypal of the nine Star Wars movies? It's got the, the deepest archetypes. Most people consider it the best one, at least in terms of intelligence. It, 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 yeah, in fact, the second one, it probably strikes back, episode five. Uh, I mean, isn't there a scene in a wood in that? Remember when he's training with Yoda? Yeah, he, 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 he kills Darth Vader, and then he takes off the mask and it's himself, right? And remember later on when he looks at the, the hand, and he realized that both of them are missing a hand, they have an artificial hand. But I mean, you're, you're facing your... One of the things you meet in the deep wood is your doppelganger. You know what that means? What's that mean in German? Sorry? You're like the second, your dark other, your doppelganger, the, the other side, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or whatever. You meet the dark side when you go into the wood. And it's particularly the fears of childhood. And I really think Tolkien has this in mind because when they leave, I mean, okay, the Black Riders, the, the, the Nazgul, they're going to get scarier and scarier. But at first, before we fully know what they are, that it's it's the terror of childhood. The the big. I mean, he looks like the the um, the, the ghost of Christmas yet to come, you know, pointing and Scrooge, you know, pointing like that. Right? And and uh, and they, they terrify. They, they they make that squealing noise. They they've got the dark breath, the black breath that they blow, and you're in a daze. And even when they meet Farmer Maggot, the wonderful name. I, I really don't want to eat dinner with the maggots. I'm sorry. I'm just no. I I, I think I've already ate. But anyway, the, <laughs> just think about it. Um, why, Why is Frodo afraid to meet with Mr. Maggot? Remember? Okay, when he was a child, good. He said, oh, I'm going to set my dogs on you. And that, that terror from childhood followed him. And he's like, oh, I wish I'd gotten over that. I would have had a good friend in you, he says to Mr. Maggot. But it's just so many of the things that happen in these early sections are dealing with that kind of fear. And, and it, it really, everything changes actually on page 74. Even, even Tolkien said this in one of his letters I remember reading. At the very bottom of page 74, everything is still, you know, despite all the scary stuff and getting out of the Shire, 
It's, it's when, when the, the Black Rider, Rider shows up. And apparently, I remember that that scared Tolkien, too. Where did that Dark Rider come from? And they do this scene particularly well in the movie, even better in the movie than the book. Right? And again, a very last thing, round the corner came a black horse, no hobbit pony, but a full-sized horse. And on it sat a large man who seemed to crouch in the saddle, wrapped in a great black cloak and hood, so that only his boots and the high stirrup showed below. His face was shadowed and invisible. When it reached the tree, when it was level with Frodo, the horse stopped. The riding figure sat quite still with his head bowed as if listening. From inside the hood came a noise as of someone sniffing. It's almost as scary as the, the breath of Darth Vader. The kind of thing. It's a, that sniffing, sniffing, right? A sudden unreasoning fear fills them. That, 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 that fear that... And you need to understand, the thing about the Black Riders, it's not just that they're super strong or anything, it's that they bring terror with them. The whole village and Bree is sort of terrified. They're, they're out of, they're, 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 you know, seeing things and whatnot. It, it, they bring a fear with their presence, with their voice, a dread, the uncanny, it's sometimes called, the numinous fear that spreads over. They, they feel that. It's, it's sort of like the, it, it ratchets up here. At this moment, we're starting to realize that this is going to be a lot scarier than The Hobbit. That there is, that there is a, a kind of dread that gets under our skin. And these hobbits are going to have to face it. Right? I mean, they're almost swallowed by a tree. I don't know, did any of you have a, a nightmare like that? Maybe not exactly like that, but kids have weird nightmares like that. Are you still afraid of being swallowed by a tree? Did any, did any of you ever see the great movie Poltergeist? Remember when that little boy, the tree's like trying to swallow him, sort of? And he's, it's swallowing him! You see, I don't mean the remake, which was unwatchable. The original Poltergeist? You haven't seen that? Bill, have you seen Poltergeist? It's one of the great horror comedies. It's actually very funny and scary at the same time. Uh, good stuff. But the... Uh, Marzi, have you seen that one, Poltergeist? It's fun. The little girl in front of the TV. They're here! Anyway, it's really cool. Uh, new with this fear, right? Because, uh, because they, they moved the cemetery, but they left the bodies there. And they built over them, right? I mean, there's this like, darkness that's there. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's those kinds of things that they have to face. They have to face th that kind of you know, deep fear that you, you can't even put into words. Right? And, and by the way, if you've seen the extended version of the movie, they do a brilliant job. They take that very scene in the old forest where the, the tree almost swallows them and then tree beard, uh, just give it away, and then Tom Bombadil saves them. They move that whole thing right over to Fangorn Forest and almost exactly the same thing happens, but tree beard. It even says the word, you know, what is it? Eat, eat dirt, drink time, whatever, drink water, go to sleep. Uh, old man willow. But again, all of these are the kinds of fears of childhood. And I don't know if you picked this. I'm going to just show you this because the first time I noticed this, it's really funny. After, uh, after Tom Bombadil saves them, I'm going to show you this because it's hysterical. Uh, let's take it. It's, uh, here it is. It's uh, page 144. He saves them, and at the top of the page, what, what do you mean, said, said S. Pippin, why not? But Tom shook his head, saying, You found yourselves again out of the deep water. Clothes are but little loss if you escape from drowning. Be glad, my merry friends, and let the warm sunlight heat, heat, uh, heat now heart and limb. Let the warm sunlight heat now heart and limb. Cast off these cold rags. Run naked on the grass while Tom goes on hunting. <laughs> Oh, like the, they're the children once more, just just before they're going to start growing up, and then they go to Bree and whatnot. But all of these weird adventures that seem like a giant tangent, in some ways, they're they're growing up, they're they're facing it. And Tom Bombadil is a strange character. Who is he? You know, uh, uh, him and Goldberry are they Adam and Eve? In some ways, they make me think of Treebeard on one side and and Galadriel on the other. They're odd. They're the oldest thing. They're not, you know, they're not God, okay, but they're the oldest. He watches over the power of song, the power of poetry. It's very strange. What's the weirdest thing that happens when Frodo shows Tom Bombadil the ring? You know what he does? The ring happens, it doesn't disappear. And then he picks it up and looks through it. And suddenly they see this funny twinkling eye looking through it. Of course, we haven't met the eye of Sauron yet. Very strange. Everybody has a different interpretation. 
I, I think it's nice that before they go on this horrible journey here to find that even if Sauron wins, that there still is something outside of his, you know, there, there's still someone living in grace, if you will. Tom Bombadil, the, the ring is meaningless to him, right? It's weird, but that's why we need our heroes, right? Because the, okay, Tom is not corrupted by the ring, but he has no desire to wield it, right? Saruman has a desire to wield it, but he's corrupted by it. So, so we need the people in the middle, particularly Gandalf, Aragorn, and Frodo, all of them, particularly those three, uh, who can deal with it somehow. Uh, but it, it's just, it's just, and you know, this character, Don Bombadil, pop, pops up in poems that uh, he wrote. He wrote the Father Christmas stories, and then Tom Bombadil shows up. And, uh, and he, there's a whole series of poems called uh, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. There's a series of cute, cute poems that Tolkien wrote, some for the kids and some for others. Um, but again, all of it is... Is it, I don't, it, it's like a preparation for them. First, they need, and they're afraid because the old forest is like you can almost hear the trees growing. Nobody wants to go in there, but they face their fears. It's getting them. It's a warm up to get them ready for what's to come. What about what about uh, the prancing pony, Bree, and the prancing pony? That, does it remind you of something? Well, where where would that be? Like in the original Star Wars, Episode Four. Yeah, they go to Tatooine, and, and more specifically, where did they go in Tatooine? The Canteen. Is it Mos Eisley? Is that what it's called? Is that what it's called? Eisley, yeah. They kill Canteen scene. Maybe makes me think of this, okay? Uh, and, and again, all, all the Scalawags, everyone coming all over, the Rangers, everybody crisscrosses all over the place. You know, men and elves, dwarves, and stuff like hobbits, they're all there. Uh, and the Rangers are always watching. Right? And the ra at first, Aragorn is a scary character, right? Kind of hiding in the corner there, right? By the way, do you think that the movie made a good change? Because in the movie, what what leads to the ring coming falling on him is Merry and Pippin start singing that silly song and dancing around. Were you shocked to find that Frodo sings it in the book? I think it actually, in some ways, makes more sense that it's Merry and Pippin. Uh, I, I think that was maybe a good good choice to change it. Uh, but anyway, again, of course, disappear. And Aragorn grabs him, okay? I think you're calling too much attention to yourself, Mr. Underwood. Uh, but again, that is a place. It's a border town. And like I said, you, you have to read with, when you're a Texan, you have to read with pride that the good guys are the Rangers, right? You have to read that. You really have to read that with pride. Did you ever want to be a Ranger, Clinton? No? Come on, Robert, would you be a good Ranger? Well, I think you want to be a Ranger right there. You want to be a Ranger? That's, That's what they do. Yeah, they're, they're the ones that find the missing people, right? Get them down and stuff like that. And, uh, like the original one, not the weird one with, with Johnny Depp. That was interesting, but weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wow. Let's look at uh, let's look at the poem about Strider that's on page let's see uh, page one seventy. This is you know it's like an old play right the the, the the always missed letter right. Romeo and Juliet might still be alive today if it wasn't for that missed letter. If those kids just had to, those kids just had cell phones they'd be okay right they would have made it. Right? But the, uh, the you know, there's always the missed letter, right? but they come together, and this wonderful poem on page 170, uh, and, and, and again, do you, do you love how the, the songs are just so interwoven in this book? They're all over the place. Everything, you know? They sing songs about taking a bath, okay? Walking down the road. Everything's epic. Everything's wonderful. It's beautiful. There's a song for every occasion, and, and uh, they fit in somehow. They're not just thrown in there. They, they, they fit in somehow with this whole world, this musical world. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. You like that? Is that one of your mottos? That's one of my mottos. I got a poster for my son with that on there. I, I got him a, a, a towel too. All those, not all those who wander are lost. By the way, if you just want a little bit of trivia, okay. Um, most people didn't like it, but I still think it was fairly interesting. Did you see the the Wolverine origin movie? 
That's, that's the other Wolverine. We went to Japan, but the Wolverine origin story. Uh, anyway, anyway if, if you remember, there's a scene where he runs away and he's naked. The girls might remember that. Uh, Hugh Jackman runs off naked, okay? And he's picked up by that old couple. Okay. When the old couple in the car go by, if you look in the back window, is a bumper sticker sort of that says, not all those who wander are lost. So I saw it in the theater and I said, oh, hey, that's good. And, you know, in, in, in a way, that, that's, that, that's um, Wolverine at that moment, right? Uh, not all those who wander are lost. But uh, again, all that is gold, again, outside and inside, they cloak their real power rather than showing it off. Right? And I love that thing, you know, well, if you were evil, I think you would have looked fairer but felt fouler. Oh, so you're saying I look foul. Well, you know, he's been out there. And, and I remember uh, watching the special that Aragorn, to make it authentic, the character of Vigo. Can you imagine a movie that's got actors named Vigo and Orlando? Those are stranger names than the Tolkien's names. But anyway, so Vigo and Orlando, okay. And, uh, but v, uh, Vigo Mortensen was actually took care of his own clothes. He, he would like sew them and patch them and just try to make it more realistic and he'd go out camping and things like that, get everybody to come with him. It's really cool. But, um, the, uh, so, not all, it, it's a riddle. Right? All that is gold does not glitter. That is the, the hidden king, the hidden prince. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not touched by the frost. There is that, that seed deep down. It, it's, ultimately, it's that, that uh, royal bloodline that, that, you know, that's on that little uh, uh, bookmark I gave you. Like I said, take that bookmark and put it into your, uh, in your book there. You can reference it if you want. And it's mostly Silmarillion, but still. It'll, it'll make you feel smart, if nothing else. Oh, I know this. Anyway. Um, from, from the ashes of fire shall be woken, the light from the shadows shall spring, renewed shall be blade that was broken, the crownless again shall be king. That's messianic. What, what do we mean when we say messianic? Then obviously, it's, it's the Bible. You know what messiah means literally? What's the Greek, what's the Hebrew word messiah mean? But anointed, right? Anointed one. That's what Christ means in Greek. The anointed one, right? Anointed for a certain thing, okay? And Marzi, tell us what Persian is called Messiah in the Bible. Is it? It's Cyrus. Right? There's a prophecy in Isaiah. I will call my anointed one, Messiah, Cyrus, because God used Cyrus, the, the, the first king of the Persian Empire, used Cyrus to allow the Jews to return back after the Babylonian Empire and rebuild the Babylonian captivity and rebuild the temple. Right? And Cyrus is the only Gentile who's called Messiah because right? he's anointed. He doesn't even know he's being anointed, but he's the anointed one. So, so we like the Persians. So. Oh, that's uh, Simeon? No, Simon. Simon of Cyrene. That's why I guess it sounds like that. Cyrene is actually in North Africa. So he might have actually been. I, I remember uh, one of the movie versions, uh, Sidney Poitier played that role. Because he might have been a black man, because he's from North Africa. So he's in North Africa. Uh, but that was that ridiculous, uh, the greatest story ever told, where they would just bring in big stars to step in for two seconds and therefore make the whole movie ridiculous. They, they brought in John Wayne just to say, surely this man is the son of God. <laughs> to be the, the centurion that says that. <laughs> you never saw that one? The greatest story ever told? I mean, I mean, it, it looks, looks beautiful. beautiful. It's just kind of dull. It just goes on forever. But uh, anyway, where was I? So, um, uh, and I, I just, I just love this. It's easy to miss this on the very bottom of page one seventy. Uh, you know, well, why didn't you, why didn't you tell us who you were right away? Why didn't you tell us who you were? And I love what he says at the very bottom. He says, "The enemy has set traps for me before now. As soon as I had made up my mind, I was ready to tell you whatever you asked. But I must admit." that I hoped you would take to me for my own sake. A hunted man sometimes wearies of distrust and longs for friendship. Not even, even he longs for that companion. He's wandered all over. They are, and then he says, but handsome is as handsome does. And isn't that what, what, uh, what's his name says? Uh, you know, the dumb guy that wins everything? The movie, the Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump said that. Stupid is as stupid as I get. Look, it's close. <laughs> what a movie that was. That was funny. Um, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, maybe we'll end with this. On, on the next page, here, here's one of the things I referenced on page uh, 171. Yeah, the next page, about halfway down, the uh, page says, That you are a stout fellow, answers Strider, 
But I am afraid my only answer to you, Sam Gamgee, is this. If I had killed the real Strider, I could kill you. And I should have killed you already without so much talk. If I was after the ring, I would have it now. He stood up and seemed suddenly to grow taller. In his eyes gleamed a light, keen and commanding. Throwing back his cloak, he laid his hand on the hilt of a sword that had hung concealed by his side. You know what, those, what that, that sword is? It's like the shards of Nursa. Doesn't do you much good, even the broken pieces that will be later forged together. The broken blade that was used to cut off. Because what happened was, and you see it in the movie, is, okay, remember there, the, the, uh, Elendil, right, the father of Isildur, Elendil was going after uh, Sauron to kill him, and he fell, and Sauron stepped on the uh, blade and broke it. But then, in the last moment always, uh, Isildur picks up the broken blade and uses it to cut off his finger, and that's where he gets the ring. And by the way, the ring is not that different than a horcrux, if you're into that. Certainly got the idea from that. Uh, and the horcrux in Harry Potter, like, the life of the bad guy is tied into that. His life is tied up with the ring. So as long as the ring is there, he's still there. That's why you have to destroy the ring, and so destroy him as well. Well, I think we covered enough. Eh, I guess that's good. You got that there? <laughs> Man, good class. So again, uh, uh, Chris and, and uh, Anthony, we're looking forward to your uh, to your artwork. And, and uh, uh, are you going to make it better than uh, Clinton's? I'm laying down a challenge here, man. I'm throwing down the gauntlet. Who will do the best? <laughs>